Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting of July 18, 2023. Um, with that, can we establish a quorum? Yeah. Ms. Kirkner, we believe is running a few minutes late. Right. Yeah. Mr. Lester? Here. Mr. Hoff? Here. Mr. Kane? Here. Mr. Smith? Mr. Robertson? Here. Mr. Soison? Here. Commissioner Gordon? Here. Secretary Matthias? Here. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, please let the record reflect that six members are present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Let's uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next on the agenda, review and approval of the agenda. Uh, any notes, comments, or changes to the agenda? No comments, I move we approve the agenda as submitted. Okay, second. And second. Second. Hi, Matt. Thank you, Matt. The uh, minutes of uh, June twentieth uh, meeting were posted. Uh, any changes or amendments to the minutes? Hearing none. If I can get a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. All right. Quick. All right. Commission member reports. Um, Janet's running a few minutes late, so. And I don't have anything. Um, Commissioner Gordon, anything? I have nothing. Thank you. Any other commission member reports? Uh, well, I will say, uh, sorry I missed our last meeting. I did listen in to the whole meeting or watched it later on. It was so our viewership went up. <laughs> I watched it after, so I didn't watch it during. <laughs> cool. It was rather long. Very good. All right. Thank you. Uh, administrative reports sitting in for Chris. Yay. Right. So we thought we'd keep this interesting and change up the secretary every month for y'all. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Chris was unable to be here and asked me to sit in for him. Um, the one and only administrative matter we thought we would uh, discuss with you is, so last month when the plans for the projects were distributed to y'all. We did that electronically. And then we also had the option to pick up the paper copies. We thought we'd open it up for discussion. And it's very funny, Mr. Hoff was just saying, like, it would be nice to eliminate all this paper and have this on my computer. So um, that is the question to you. Are you comfortable going to an all digital format? Um, it could be a hybrid, but then we're in a scenario where we're, you know, we're getting some plans and not others. So talk amongst yourselves. Any, uh, and I believe that Laura checked into, we do have a couple of tablets. Is that right, Laura? Yes, I have two in the department that could be used. And I know some of you also bring in your laptops or iPads too. I know I use them, uh, I spread them out on my uh, family room floor. <laughs> 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 and uh, you know there's I, I don't look at I'll be honest I don't look at every page the first page is important and then some of the detail on perhaps landscaping or yeah. things like that I'll, I'll get into uh, and I know it would be a, a big help for my uh, mail delivery person to not uh, bring the brick and deliver it to the porch because uh, some of those are yeah. you know massive so uh, I guess my only question would be the format of the uh, document on a uh, laptop. It, you know, on, on a um, is it a, would it be a PDF? Would it be mm -hmm. you know? So Adobe, you can Adobe. What? What? Adobe, how does it come over? Yeah, how would okay. it come over? So, so already established right now. Development review does we post to the development review website, which is I think what Laura Bavetta had provided a link to you for last month. So we post that on the website. It is a PDF, and you could look at the abbreviated version or the full version. Is of course larger file size, but we do use PDF format. And you're able to zoom on those things and all yes. that kind of stuff. 
It's something that we could give it a test run if you wanted to and and revisit it in a few months and like see see what you think. How about if you want paper, which I do. Uh, <coughs> I, you know, I, I have no problem with the, with the paper, but I, I don't like the electronic. Okay. Any other opposed to? So, I mean, is it an issue you're looking for an all or nothing, or would you prefer that we all go to one format, or, because it sounds like as long as we have someone who prefers paper, we probably ought to stay with paper. I'm fine with either. I don't have a strong. Okay. Um, uh, so, what, or are you looking for a yes or no, or? So that was my thinking, yes or no. It gets a little complicated yep. when we track how many people want paper and who, who we're mailing it to and who we're not. So, well, can, can I, I ask that you send it electronically and paper? Let us try the electronic while we also have the paper. Can we do both? We could do that. And, we could continue if, to and send see if we can gravitate towards electronic. Um, right. yep. You know, just just see how. Let let us see if we you know how much. Uh, Fidelity, we're losing by looking at it over over our, our whatever mediums we that have. That sounds around. good. That's good Is idea. that okay? Yeah. So we will we will redirect you to that development review website where you can find the plans each month. They are posted there. Right. So we'll just make sure that everybody knows where to find that and can locate the plans electronically. Thank you. That's for a the good options. idea, Mr. Lester. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that works. Okay. Any other comments? Welcome. Hi. Where are we? We are in uh, administrative reports. We voted you a pay raise. Oh, good. <laughs> gave you a, a gigantic <laughs> pay raise, and uh, we're going to keep paper, the, the uh, plans that we receive, um, and we're also going to receive electronically to try to migrate right. away from paper, but we'll see how it goes. Yes. Got that. Okay. Perfect. Um, so just I apologize um, some mornings just go all awry but um, so the under commission member reports I just wanted to note I have nothing to report um, but it looks like we'll be having some soon so mm. looking forward to that um, administrative report, um, Ms. Matthias. That the one item that we just discussed with the paper electronic for the mm -hmm. plan sets was the only item that I have today. Thank you. Okay. Are there any extensions? There are extensions, and I have those as well. So, right. we've had multiple extensions. We usually have maybe one or two, but I think there's five in my pile here today. Um, so first off, Living Waters Garden Center is a S13007 was the file number. This was the eighth extension. And I will say they are inches from their finish line going through the legal document process, but they weren't quite at the point where they were going to make the, the July 22nd uh, expiration date. So they did extend that project. Uh, it's in Commissioner District 3, and it was the eighth extension. Um, Carroll Station 3 is relatively newer, S20007. This was the first extension for this site plan. The same site is now the one that is working through um, for the Wendy's in Eldersburg. So once they get that, then the old plan is extinguished. But they wanted to hold on to that um, approval. And that's Commissioner District 5. The rest of these are uh, subdivisions. We have Rosie Acres, M09001. This is two lots of subdivision. It is the 12th extension for this project, and it's in Commissioner District 4. And in there, I was asked previously about reasoning. Sometimes they provide us why this one um, notes the current cost of building materials and availability, so they requested an extension. So that was approved. The next one is Walker Wood Estates 2, Section 2, M09025. This is a one lot subdivision and it is the 12th extension in Commissioner District 2. 
this, they have also indicated that they're looking to move forward at this time with recordation and getting that all wrapped up. And Lake Forest Estates, Section 2, P02052. This is the 15th extension for this. There are 27 lots in this subdivision, and it's in Commissioner District 4. And you may all be familiar or not with this, um, but there were some groundwater issues in the area that they have been continually um, working with the health department to um, retest groundwater continuously over the course of time. So it's improving was the indication. So that's a good sign. And that is the extent of the extensions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any BZA cases? Yes, Randall Mitchell is going to present the BZA cases. Thank you for the introduction, Laura. So I had two BZA cases to um, present before the commission. The first is case 6455. This request is for a conditional use for a cattery of 10 cats or over and multiple variances on a Mount Airy property off of Ritchie Drive. The property is in the ag zone on a 1.84 acre lot. The planning staff finds this request for a conditional use and variances is consistent with the 2014 master plan and would not have an adverse effect on the current use of the property and surrounding area. And the second case was 6456. This request is for a conditional use for a vehicle sales lot and multiple variances on a Sykesville property on off of Adam Smith Street. This property is zoned industrial light and is on a 1.03 acre lot. Planning staff finds this request for a conditional use and variances is consistent with the 2018 Freedom Community Comprehensive Plan and would not have an adverse effect on current use of the property with some conditions outlined in the memo. And a public hearing meeting has been set tentatively for July 26 um, to hear both of these cases. That's all I had. Easy A. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? administrative matters? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is item eight, the concept site plan. I believe Kirsten is going to present. Good morning, Planning Commission and everybody. Hello. Let me get my, oh, that's a lot of PowerPoints. Hold on. <laughs> my PowerPoint pulled up here. Okay, all right, good morning. I am Kirsten Marple of Carroll County's Development Review. Um, here with you with the, the concept site plan for Westminster Solar, file number S210019. Um, if I could, if you could introduce yourselves as well. Good morning, Kelly Schaefer Miller, 73 East Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. I'm here this morning on behalf of the applicant, uh, and I have with me Annie Wagner, uh, who's a representative from the solar company as well. Good morning, thank you. Um, the address is 2003 Western Avenue, Suite 225, Seattle, Washington. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly and Annie. Okay, so we are here before you today with a concept site plan. This is for the Westminster Solar Project, just north of the city of Westminster, outside of the city of Westminster, which is why we are presenting it to you and the county here. Um, it is not being annexed, it is in the county and will remain in the county. Um, this is a concept site development plan. It might look a little bit familiar. This was before the Planning Commission almost exactly a year ago for a special report and we will get to that in a minute. That was about setbacks. Um, and we'll go through the history of the property. But first, I want to introduce you to where it is, if you don't remember it, or if this is the first time you're seeing it. So Westminster Solar is on a property, like I said, just outside the city limits. You can see it highlighted in green up here. The purple indicates that it's industrial zoning, industrial light, in fact. 
the yellow over here is residential, and then the areas that are not colored in are within city limits. Largely developed as a business park, this is the um, Air Park Business Park, and a additional business park to the north as well. So the site here, you've probably driven past it if you've ever headed up that way and you've seen it on the right. It's right at the corner of Old Bachman Valley Road. Um, there's currently nothing really on it. There's a billboard. Um, it's an open field. There's some trees you can see the southwestern corner of the property. <clears throat> the proposal for this property is to develop it as a solar panel field, a solar panel field or a solar energy generation, generating system is a principal use in this zoning district. This is industrially zoned. This is not agriculturally zoned, although it's currently a field and next to a farm field, as you can see from this image. So this use as a solar field is a principal permitted use in the zoning district. And that is not impacted by anything else going on in the code right now. Okay. <clears throat> so this is just a, a Google image from the side of the road. You've, like I mentioned, you might have seen this coming down from north down to Westminster off of 97. The property is on the left-hand side on this image. As you can see, there's the billboard there. It's really the only thing on the property. It's previously been used as farm fields. As I recall now, I think it's just a, a field right now. And these are just some images from Old Bachman Valley Road. You can see the corner where it meets 97 here on the top left, and then the rest of it is off of Old Bachman Valley Road. There's an existing paved entrance right about here, which is what this image is which will be the entrance that they are using. So it's not going to be a new entrance onto Old Bachman Valley Road. Um, if you're familiar with Old Bachman Valley Road too, it closes just a short distance in. Um, they've put a barrier up there so the road is not a through road anymore. So this entrance is existing and it's prior to that closure. Okay, so now that we're kind of familiar with the property, I wanted to introduce you to the proposal. So like I mentioned, this is a solar panel field. Um, which is, again, a permitted use in this district. They're proposing the site to be developed with the solar panels in the center, obviously, with the fence surrounding it. And then outside of that fence, also, there will be landscaping. So it'll be solar panels, fence, and landscaping. The landscaping was discussed in our previous meeting for this project, the special report we had about a year ago. Um, landscaping is not required by code for a industrially zoned solar generating facility. However, if the developer wants to change the setbacks, the code allows a provision where they can change the setbacks and reduce them. Planning Commission can approve to reduce them if landscaping is provided. So this is what we talked about last year for this project. Landscaping was provided. The setbacks were proposed to be reduced by 50%, which is allowed per code if the Planning Commission approves it. And it was presented to the Planning Commission last year, and that was approved. So the setbacks from all four property lines here were reduced by 50% um, from 200 feet to 100 on the west, where we saw there was residential zoning and a house. And from the other districts, um, which are industrially zoned in the city, and then also industrially zoned and residential over here, were reduced as well by 50%. Um, so that was approved previously, and that's what this plan shows. The landscaping that was provided is a 15-foot buffer, a 15-foot deep landscaping area. Let's move ahead a little bit and we'll talk about that. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a schematic of what the landscaping is proposed to look like. And we have some renderings too that I'll show you that's pretty exciting. So the fence line on the inside, again, solar panels here. Landscaping on the outside, it's a mix of shrubs and um, evergreen trees as well as scattered deciduous trees as well. So trees that will lose, the, lose their leaves, but primarily evergreens. Um, so this is a view shed rendering. I'm going to show you a few pictures here of what that landscaping looks like from the outside. Again, this was all already approved. This was approved in conjunction with the setback reductions. This is just for the sake of example and for the public benefit, okay? So this is just a view shed showing you where these pictures, these renderings are based off of. So this is that billboard again, and you can see this is a rendering, so it looks a little funny. Everything looks the same, but 
Um, these are the, the deciduous trees, and then you would also have the evergreens here a little lower down. I, I don't even know that you can see the fence here. Um, this is a rendering of what it would look like after the trees have grown. So obviously trees, you get them, they're, they're small. You're not going to transport a tree that's, I don't know, 30, 40 feet tall. Um, so this is a, a future rendering of what it would look like in the future. And there's a few others, too, that show mostly the same thing. And then the view from, if you're coming up Route 97, going north on the right, this is where the solar panel field is. You can see a little cutaway here where you can see the fence in the panels. That's the area where the interconnective, or inter interconnection will happen with the BG&E power lines. So I'll bring us back to the site plan. Okay, we have the black and white site plan, which is what you were sent, but we also received a color rendering, and I think I want to talk about that instead. <laughs> it's a little bit easier to see. Um, so as I mentioned, the solar panels in the middle, a fence outside of that, and then the landscaping. You can also see here a forest conservation easement area on the northeast side. This is between the nearest residential structure and the site and helps provide not only screening over time, but also it achieves their forest conservation requirements. Um, and then these symbols you're seeing here are stormwater management features. So they'll have wa the water will channel off or flow off and then flow to these swales, these bioswales, um, that will help absorb the water and slow the water. There's also, and you can't see them in these pictures, but next to those swales underground, there's underground storage facilities for the stormwater if it overflows um, to help control quantity for higher activity storms, higher water level storms. So concept, or yes, concept stormwater management's been approved for that. Forest conservation requirements have also been approved for that. Um, we also had to work with the State Highway Administration for this project. As you can see, the, the pink, pro pink outline here is the property boundaries. And you can see it expands right to the middle of Route 97. As you might be aware, if you travel that way, they've been expanding Route 97 to the north of this site, and it will work its way down eventually over time. Don't have a timetable for that yet. Um, but this design was designed to accommodate that future expansion. This has been reviewed by SHA quite a few times, um, and things are in place to accommodate for that. Grading office, sediment control offices have approved the project. Water resource management's approved the project too. There's no streams, no floodplains. Floodplain had no requirements. Fire protection has also looked at the site. Um, the only request was that there was previously a driveway entrance in this location. They did not want them using both, so the entrances are consolidated to this one, which will be easier to access and maneuver in for emergency apparatus. Carroll County Airport 2, if you're familiar with the site, is right across the street. They looked at this plan as well. They reviewed it for FAA requirements, and there are no issues here for solar panels. In fact, if you're familiar with the area, there's solar panels even closer to the airport site that have been there for a long time. So this is not going to be an issue for airplanes coming and going from the airport. And the only other thing I wanted to note here are well, actually a couple of things. So on the plans that you have, it has a detail for a chain link fence. Um, I've been in communication with the developers, and they were nice enough to send me these pictures. Uh, they would like to change the chain link fence to a more agricultural style fence. You can see on the top left here, wooden posts, it looks like, with a square style of metal fencing across them, as, as opposed to chain link. Um, and additionally, and it doesn't really say it on the plans, but they also wanted to express that beneath the solar panels, they are putting a pollinator-friendly habitat down there, as opposed to just grass. It'll be something that um, you know, provides flowers for pollinators locally and also complies with stormwater management requirements, so it will utilize water and help reduce runoff. Um, and I think in my report I might have mentioned the solar panels were not fixed. They are, they are fixed. So they're still fixed. Okay. It started out a little bit different. So the solar panels are fixed, and here is an example of what that would look like. And they are stationary and face one direction. I have two renderings here that look pretty similar. If you look at the bottom left, 
where the entrance is, you'll see it changes a little bit. So this is based off of the current plan that we have, the copy that you have and that we've reviewed. Um, the developer brought to my attention that their intention is to adjust that a little bit. So if I flip to the next page, you'll see that change a little bit. And what happened there is that the interconnectivity shifted to be next to the driveway instead of being over towards Route 97. Okay, so it used to connect here and there was a gap in the landscaping right at the corner. And they've worked with BG&E to change that so it's next to the driveway instead. That way they have one gap here and otherwise the landscaping will be continuous. It's a very small change. It won't pack, impact our plan reviews, but I wanted to bring it up to you as that is a change in the landscaping buffer. It changes it so it's more continuous. If anything, it's probably an improvement. It's a very small change. So I think that is all that I have. Again, this is just a concept review. That's the second time you're seeing it only because we had the special report originally that approved the setback reductions and the inclusion of the landscaping. We're just here for concept at this point. Um, we encourage any discussion and questions. And I also wanted to mention that if you've decided to forward this to the chair, that is something you can do here too. So when the final comes in for final approval, we would just work directly with the chair for that approval. Okay. Um, Ms. Miller, do you have anything to Thank add? Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Kirkner and the entire commission. Um, really just here to answer any questions that you might have. It has been a year and I know there's been some membership change to this commission since we were last here. Um, so Annie is prepared to share with you a little bit just about community solar in general. This is a community solar project. I really appreciate Kirsten's um, staff report and all of the visuals that she provided. Just briefly, I did want to touch on a, a few specific items. The interconnectivity of those poles was a result of BG&E comments. They felt that this was a safe connected point, if you will, and so that's why that shifted there that you saw. Uh, Kirsten did point out the agricultural style fence, which as she stated will be in between the panels and the landscaping. So as you could see from those renderings, once that landscaping is matured, you may or may not be able to see what any kind of fence looks like at all anyhow, but that would be the proposal for the agricultural style fence. Um, this, is, this site is zoned I-1, as you all are familiar with, and so although solar use on I-1 has specific setback requirements, I think it is worth noting that other I-1 uses have much lesser setback requirements. And so I think this site really provides a nice transition in intensity of use, if you will, from the southern property to the more industrial heavy properties, or I shouldn't say industrial heavy because that's a term of art, but uh, more heavily used industrial properties to the north of this. Solar is incredibly limited in its use characteristics. There's really no traffic parking associated with it. Um, so like I said, Annie's here just to share a little bit about community solar and we are here. We also have um, representatives from Kimley Horn, the engineering group who prepared the site plan in case there are any specific questions that anyone might have about the plans. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I would just like to echo Kelly's appreciation for you all being here this morning to discuss our project. Um, we look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Um, but to provide a little bit of context about One Energy, we've been a solar developer since 2009, um, and a lot of our work has been here in the state of Maryland. We have completed over 160 megawatts of solar projects, nine of which are community solar projects just like Westminster Solar. Uh, the Maryland Community Solar Energy Generating Systems Program is a unique opportunity for residents, businesses, nonprofits to choose to subscribe to the solar project um, to see a 10%, roughly a 10% discount on their electric bill. So what's great about this program is it provides uh, individuals who rent their homes, businesses who don't own the building that they're operating in, um, even if you can put solar on your roof and don't want to, you can choose to subscribe to this uh, to see the financial savings of owning your own solar project. It also provides larger um, environmental benefits to the community. So this project is one and a half megawatts in size. That would power roughly 150 to 200 Maryland houses, which is equivalent to avoiding over 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions every year. 
some additional unique benefits that this project will provide, as Kirsten had mentioned, is the pollinator habitat that will be seated underneath the panel array area. This pollinator habitat will include a seed mix with over 30 varieties of flowers and grasses, including flowers like purple cone flower, black-eyed Susan, and New England asters. Um, all of those are very beautiful flowers and native bees and butterflies really enjoy them as well. Um, this critical pollinator habitat helps to support agricultural operations that rely on pollination um, for fruit production. And in addition to the pollinator habitat, the type C landscape buffer that we have proposed will provide additional um, trees, shrubs, um, as Kirsten had provided an overview of for the project and for the community. Uh, the vegetative screening is anticipating to plant around 50 major deciduous trees, around 60 evergreen trees, and over 100 shrubs as part of the vegetative screen. Um, so all of this vegetation provides great habitat for native insects, as well as stormwater benefits, um, soil stabilization, and uh, it helps to make sure that the soil can rest, similar to the Maryland uh, Conservation Program, which enrolls farmland for soil to replenish nutrient-rich soil. So similar to that, it helps the property rest and can be restored for any uses in the future. Um, thank you for hearing our project and look forward to discussing it. Thank you. Well, any questions? I have, I have a couple. Okay. Um, forgive me if this would be redundant. Uh, this is my second time at a meeting of this commission, but I do have a couple questions. Um, it's a hundred, one, one and a half megawatts, is that right? That's What's correct. What's the minimum? that's feasible for a community solar. So is it a half a megawatt? Is that feasible for your company? Could you give me a little insight on that, please? Um, yeah, I don't think we've- This is a relatively small area. That's what, what I'm wondering about. Yeah, yeah, these projects are very small. Um, as a company, we don't typically do projects smaller uh, than one megawatt in size, um, but the Maryland community solar market allows for projects up to five megawatts in size. And um, how tall is the agricultural fencing that you're gonna be putting in? How, how tall is it? Yeah, so it should be around six to eight feet in height, um, and that's just for security purposes and safety purposes. The fence would be how tall? around six to eight feet. Okay. Um, see, I had another. Oh, who's responsible for the main maintenance of the trees, the shrubs, uh, the, the underlying habitat and vegetation? Who's responsible for that and for how long? Definitely. Uh, so we would contract with a local vegetation management company. What's great about the native pollinator habitat is once it's established, it's relatively low maintenance. Um, but to help it establish in the beginning, we would perform routine mowings of the vegetation underneath the panels. The mowings would occur roughly once a quarter for the first few years. And once it's established, it would be more around once a year. So the mowing would be once a year and it would be probably after August, after the, I'm going by the CREP program. Mm -hmm. that they, they allow mowing once a year. It's usually after uh, August or around August, uh, is, that, is that the way this works? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, depending on if there are any weeds on site, they would be mowing it prior to plants going to seed. Once the native plants have established better, it would be more so mowing after they would go to seed. And they usually do that because of the, uh, um, uh, some of the wildlife habitat. Uh, that's why I was asking about that, the wildlife habitat, I'm talking about the birds and different things like that. CREP program allows you to mow after the nesting seasons and all that. Is that, does that work? Is that the same rules and regulations here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if the project doesn't need to be mowed, if the vegetation's maintained well and the height is reasonable, um, there wouldn't be a need to mow the site, so. And then Kirsten, does the county then oversee the mowing the vegetation to make sure that's done in a proper fashion or, or not? Internally within the site, 
So once the site has been established and all of the stormwater management features, including the material beneath the solar panels, the flowers, are established and doing well versus, to, versus you know, not really doing too great, we can't let it go if it's going to be a mud pit. Right, so we would do regular inspections in regard to the stormwater management aspect of that material beneath the solar panels. Once that's established and everything's good, I think that generally, and I'm not entirely sure if they have a, a long-term schedule of inspections, but generally if there was an issue, somebody can call and submit a complaint about there being an issue, just like with pretty much everything else, um, after we have acknowledge that everything is established and going well. So it would be probably after the point where they're only cutting it once a year that we would stop looking at it. I'm, I'm a Johnson grass hater. Right. <laughs> and I see many of these sites that are required to be mowed once a year. It's too doggone late by the mm. time it's mowed. So then the Johnson grass goes to the neighbor. Right. And there's neighboring farms in the area right across right. the road, as a matter of fact. Yes, and this, this site had previously had Johnson grass on it and had been called out to get that removed. So my understanding that's under control right now, and I'm sure they'll be checking for that before they establish anything. Um, and again, once the, once the vegetation is established, it should be established to the point where it's not allowing much competition um, of anything coming in there. So, but again, if there's ever any issues with that, complaints can always be called in. Zoning office is a good place to start and probably where you'll stay if there's any concerns or questions and it will get to the right people to tackle whatever the issue is over the years. Thank you. Yeah, and just one note on the Johnson grass, we are working with a local expert um, to help us handle the Johnson grass on site uh, with mowings and spot treatments um, to hopefully make a smooth transition to the pollinator habitat, so thank you. Any? No? No, okay. Um, do we have any public that wishes to speak on this? Okay. Seeing. We have one. We do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, please speak, speak clearly into the microphone as we are being recorded. Uh, John Frock. Uh, I own the farm across from this. So, uh, I've called in about the Johnson grass, I guess, when they first. Uh, took over and they stopped planting any uh, crops and it's completely covered with Johnson grass. And even just mowing it, it, it you know, like Ralph and Matt know, it just comes to seed shorter. You know, when you mow it, it, it just stunts it a little, but it's still, and we're getting it in our fields. I mean, we, we maintain it and, and take care of it, but we would make sure it's, uh, like to make sure it's taken care of because I'm not sure that's not what's going to choke out the wildflowers. You know instead of those choking out the Johnson grass because it's, it's tough stuff. You know, if, if they don't kill it all before they start, it's you know, rough, so. All right, that's all. Uh, thank you for bringing it up, though, Ralph. Bye. Thank you. Any other comments? Ms. Kirkner, I would just say one additional thing, if I will. Um, this plan has been in the works for a few years now. We're, we're pretty confident in the design that you're seeing here. Uh, we don't anticipate any significant changes to this design, so we, I would echo what Kirsten said, and we would request that you delegate authority to the chair for final approval. If there is a substantial change, we'll come back. Um, but if not, I, I think what you're seeing here is what will be the final plan. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so it is a concept plan, but um, if you all wish, you can consider delegating approval of the final site plan to the chair. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll uh, make a motion that we approve and delegate uh, approval to uh, the chair. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to delegate approval of the final site plan to the chair. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. You have your um, 
motion approved. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, next on the agenda is yeah. the final site plan for S220001 Hummingbird Chateau. Um, Amy will be presenting. Good morning. Good morning. Not to be controversial. Good morning. Yeah. For the record, Clark Schaefer. Uh, on behalf of the uh, owner and applicant, Mike Housley, who is here with me today. Good morning again. My name is Amy Barcroft. I'm here with the Bureau of Development Review along with the developer and his counsel. We're here for S220001, which is Hummingbird Chateau. This is a request for the approval of the final site plan in accordance with Chapter 155 this morning. This project is located at 1920 Bachman Valley Road in Manchester, and this is Commissioner District 1. This property is located uh, east of the town of Manchester. Most of the property is zoned agricultural with a small section zoned conservation. There is a two-story farmhouse and an existing barn on the site. And we are here today to talk about their conversion of the property into a country inn and wedding venue. This property is surrounded by farm fields and agricultural sites, and it is served by private well and septic. There are several environmental features on the property, including uh, some wetlands and a forested water protection easement, which has already been recorded and not affected by the development of this project. On October 27, 2021, the Board of Zoning Appeals approved this request for a conditional use for the country and in wedding facility on the subject property with one condition, that live music must cease after 10 p.m. when the events are held. And a note to that effect has been added to the plan. This project came before you in March 21st, 2023, where you reviewed the concept site plan You can see in the photos the existing historic barn, which the owner has been working to uh, refurbish. Um, you can see in the bottom pictures the farmhouse in the distance, which will be used for the country inn component. And you can see the current uh, gravel driveway, which accesses Bachman Valley Road. The plan proposes that the uh, barn host indoor events for up to 100 people and that barn is approximately 6,000 square feet. The plan proposes the addition of an attached patio and the addition of parking areas. 68 new parking spaces are proposed including six compliant handicap spaces. Um, the parking was tabulated for one space per three persons based on the venue capacity of 100 people, as well as one space for the guest room as required by the code. The driveway apron is proposed to have a paved entrance to Bachman Valley Road, and it would be relocated 132 feet to the west uh, because there were some concerns for the current site distance. Uh, on Bachman Valley Road, um, so it's being relocated with the approval of State Highway. There are three parking areas proposed with 20 foot wide access drives connecting them. A grid like paver is being used as reinforced turf, 
for the parking areas and the access drives between them will be gravel for increased durability. Oh, let me skip back for a second. Um, lighting is proposed to be a few uh, building mounted lights around the entranceways, uh, excuse me, the access doors of the barn and some pole mounted solar powered lighting which will be antique style, kind of like a wrought iron look. Mm -hmm. Um, to go with the uh, historic look of the property will be illuminating the parking and walkways. No signage or freestanding signs are proposed for this venue at the entrance or other uh, anywhere else on the property. The landscape plan proposes the addition of screening along the front property line that borders Bachman Valley Road and that will be deciduous trees and shrubs. On this slide, you can see uh, part of the plan is that the adjacent property owner has provided written permission to utilize the pond on his property with the construction of an access drive suitable for emergency vehicles that will serve as the fire protection for the venue. This is the alternative to using an automated sprinkler system in the historic barn, which became difficult due to the availability of the public water connection from Manchester. So this will require a fire protection access easement uh, to be recorded with the plan and emergency services has approved this final plan. Oops, excuse me. This project ex is exempt from floodplain management. It is out of the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Utilities. A forest conservation variance was approved for removing a few specimen trees needed for the installation of the septic system and all other forest on the property will be retained in a forest conservation easement to be recorded with this plan. Water resource management has approved the plan and final stormwater management has been granted. Grading has approved this plan and a grading permit is required before any work begins. And again, State Highway and our engineering review here at the county have approved the entrance relocation and improvements for that fire protection uh, access at the pond on the adjoining property. The health department, soil conservation and site compliance have all approved the final plan. So pursuant to chapter 155, county staff is now recommending approval of this final site plan subject to these following conditions. That the developer enters into a public works agreement with Carroll County that guarantees the completion of improvements that a stormwater easement maintenance agreement be granted to the commissioners, that a fire protection easement be granted to the commissioners simultaneously with the public works agreement, and that a forest conservation easement also be granted to the Carroll County commissioners. Again, there are some photos of the property as it looks today. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer those about uh, the wedding venue. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Schaefer. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we ag agree to the conditions uh, of approval and are here to answer any questions uh, you may have. It's been a fairly long road. This, the, of course, they all are, aren't they? Um, the long and winding road. Um, this BZA was, uh, was approved on November 2nd, 2021. Um, no, not that that's unusual, but I'm just saying it's been a long road and here we are and uh, appreciate your attention to the matter. Is that it? Okay. Um, and would you like to say anything? Well, I, I almost never don't say anything, so I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yes, here we have something that's not unfamiliar to you or Carroll County because it has become a big uh, use that apparently we are well situated for. We're in the metropolitan area but we have this rural charm that is just heavily desirable for these events and you can get to them within 40 minutes and we our firm has a lot of experience with this as you know we've taken a lot of them through and one thing that that we're learning 
uh, from the people that do these is that it is that rural charm. And so there's this uh, uh, clash between Carroll County's, you know, environmental and, and site regulations, which are like pave, pave, pave. And, and, and people are saying to me, the people that come out here, they don't want all this paving. They want to be walking over grass when they go to places. So uh, what I'm getting to here is that this site really fits neatly. Uh, and I guess a little bit of luck, but a little bit of smart on Mike's part. Um, this barn is just spectacular, uh, historic, uh, lots of work, but spectacular. And the only reason it can be used is because he, he's, he's got a friendly neighbor he's made friends with, the farmer, who is letting him use the pond for the, for the fire protection. Otherwise, you, have, you go, sorry, sprinkle, sprinkler the building. He's like, can't use the barn, got to put a tent up. Um, so this really fits well. Um, and I don't know if you remember the ones that were here that we showed what he did to the house. It was, it was really spectacular, uh, the work uh, in the house. So uh, we come here with all the approvals, um, and we ask uh, you to uh, approve the final site plan so that he can move forward with his public works agreement and uh, in the near future, hopefully start uh, hosting the, the events. The one thing I'd like to ask is uh, the, where you had the fire, uh, the driveway going in, would also have like a pipe that they can just hook up to and suck out, or will they have to throw into the pond? Just saying that because it's normally a benefit for all the neighbors within such a distance for their insurance because they have the fire protection do you know the answer to that mike nothing was mentioned about a pipe they did mention that the hose was a certain length that they had to drop so they had to be so close to it so they went out there and met and it and filled it all the requirements that they had so so it might be a benefit for the neighbors i know the county had some money from the fire departments and they put in a retention uh, tank on my farm and it increased my insurance quite a bit so. mm -hmm. Good to know. Okay. Any other comments? No. You guys are quiet today. No. I'll make a motion. Um, public well, comment. Public comment. Public comment. Yes. <laughs> so, is there any public that would like to speak on this? Um, Okay, I don't see any. So, whoever wanted to okay. make a motion. Pursuant to Chapter 155, I make a recommendation to approve the site, the final site plan S22 001. Okay. Subject to the conditions. Subject to the four conditions. Okay. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very Please much. Stand Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. While we're fumbling through papers, Jim, I've got a question. Yes, sir. All right, so we approve venues like the one we just did. Um, you know, we had a, long, a lengthy discussion last week, or the last time we met here, about noise from a church. Mm -hmm. um, we, if someone continually violates the noise provisions, what yes. is the county's recourse for? You know, in, in, in trying, I'm just thinking through, and we did receive an email about someone concerned about the noise from that prod. You know, so let's act, not act like we didn't hear anything, that everything right. was positive. We did get a negative comment on mm -hmm. that venue. So, you know, 
what is the county's recourse when someone continually violates the, t the you know, it's supposed to be off at 10 p.m.? What's sure. the county's recourse? So there are two um, things the county can do. One is the noise ordinance where the sheriff's office can go out, and if it con is a continuous problem, um, the sheriff's office can find them and issue citations to the property owner for being too loud or going um, further than 10 p.m. Yep. Um, also, since this was a BZA approval <laughs> and the, one of the conditions was uh, the 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. cutoff, mm -hmm. um, zoning can enforce the, that. So if this becomes a persistent problem, zoning can then go um, enforce this, which could be citations or basically a court order saying you need to stop by 10 or you're going to be held in shut contempt down? of court and yeah. shut down. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to do. Thank you. Okay. It's a good point because a, a lot of uh, venues, wedding venues, receptions, the uh, the uh, folks that are hosting are offered an opportunity to extend for an hour. Sure. Know, all that kind of thing. So, uh, oh, you know, that's good to play know. one more song, you know. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. We've all been there. All right. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If the sheriff goes out to determine if there's too much noise, how does he do that? Is it by decibel level? It used to be by decibel level, but that um, was practically unworkable due to the meters. Um, they were too unreliable and too expensive, and he had to update them quite frequently. So now um, the county just uses a sort of unreasonably loud standard. So it's sort of like you know it when you see it um, type of uh, thing that the sheriff's office would do. So it's sort of a, it's a individualized situation, case-by-case -case basis. Well, one of the things that I'm, I'm wondering is, and, and we'll, we'll move on and because I'm, I'm out of order and I know and I'll apologize, but, you know, in, in thinking through this, and again, Bachman Valley is a, a beautiful, I've, I've run down that road or haven't in the last five, six years, as you can tell by my appearance, but... Um, <laughs> That's a beautiful road, um, and those people bought those homes there, you know, because of that. Again, we were we were we're selling to tranquil, agrarian, um, scenic vistas here, um, and so preserving that's important to all of us. Um, so, you know, one of the things that that I have concerns about is within our ordinance. You know, we we're mainly relying on landscaping and and things that are visual uh, you know in my prior life I'm, i was told landscaping did not abate noise worth a darn mm -hmm. it basically takes hardscape uh -huh. it takes you know dirt concrete brick i mean something an obstacle otherwise the noise is just going to go through it and so we don't require berms around these venues and and i don't think any of us because of the agrarian nature of, of where we live, want to see some palisade or bulwark around a property. That's not what we want either. But requiring these people not just to have the landscaping, but also to have berms that, that can ab help abate the noise, I think that's maybe something we want to look at. Look at. Otherwise, we're just going to have more and more people um, I'm not sure the noise, I, I'm not sure how compatible all this is um, with the people who have bought in there and live, live there and you know, have made investments and want that quiet lifestyle. We're, we're doing a disservice to the community if we don't look into requiring some sort of berm around some of these properties. And so that's just a suggestion um, that we consider on down the road when we look at these plans. Let's, let's maybe look into requiring some berms around these venues, particularly where the noise is. Mm -hmm. Is that something we can do, Jim? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. Moving on. I'm sorry. We are moving on. Thank so you. item 10 is a recess. Let's take um, 10 minutes. Okay.
All right, we will resume with the uh, item 11, final subdivision plan for FX 200006, Shamrock Estates. Good morning. Good morning, David. Good morning. David B. Kraft with the Bureau of Development Review. As mentioned, we're moving on to the next project on the agenda, which is Shamrock Estates, file number FX200006. Uh, with me are a few representatives of that project who I will let introduce themselves. Thank you, David. Good morning, Kelly Schaefer Miller, 73 East Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. I'm here today on behalf of the applicant, and I also have Mr. John Sarah with me, a representative from Patapsco 91 LLC. And we also have Linda Alexander in the back from CLSI to answer any technical questions, and Shane McQuay also from Patapsco 91. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what this project is proposing is a six lot residential subdivision and it is before the Planning Zoning Commission as a final subdivision plan. Uh, so with that, we are looking for approval of the final plan of subdivision pursuant to Chapter 155 and conditional approval of the final subdivision plan in conjunction with Chapter 156. And I'll get into that as we move through this project. Um, but I, I will mention this is more or less, um, I'll, I'll say abnormal. So this is before the Planning Zoning Commission due to concurrency management, as this was before the Planning Zoning Commission last year, uh, back around mid-2022. to 2022. Um, So this is more or less a formality in front of the Planning Zoning Commission to retest those facilities that did not get or deemed adequate during the preliminary plan stage. Uh, in fact, there is a provision in our code that states final plans automatically go to the chair. Uh, I believe this is one of those instances where even the commission members were talking about going to the chair, uh, but due to the way the code is written, this had to come back before the full Planning Zoning Commission for the retest of that facility that was not deemed adequate. So uh, for those who are unfamiliar, who may not have been on the commission uh, back when this was presented as a preliminary plan, uh, this is off of Gamber Road. Uh, this is Old Gamber Road here, and the site itself is outlined with the, the blue site label there. So uh, the project is uh, more or less between Deer Park Road and Hughes Road and is in Commissioner District Number 2. So the property itself is comprised of about 10 acres and is zoned R40,000. Uh, the property previously contained a residential dwelling as well as a private driveway as you can see uh, the dwelling has since been removed and the driveway i believe is all that remains here the the properties that surround the subject property are either zoned r40,000 or r zoned conservation and they contain single family dwellings as you can see from this aerial shot uh, the property is outside the designated growth area, the priority funding area, as well as water and sewer service areas. Uh, the subject property and all adjoining properties are currently served by public, by private water, by private well and septic systems. This is my Monday back, so I apologize for all of that. Um, so what is being proposed is, again, to subdivide the property into six residential sites. Uh, the lots themselves will range in size from 1.41 acres to 1.82 acres, with the property being zoned R40,000. These lot sizes are within compliance of the zoning code. Access to the lots are to be served by two use and common driveways one of which is currently existing on the north side of the, the property. It is Four Leaf Drive. And this will serve these three lots uh, that are proposed up here. And then there is a second use of common driveway proposed that will come off of Old Gamber Road here that will serve three lots uh, in this area here. So although the property does have frontage onto Old Gamber Road as well as Gamber Road, 
uh, direct access onto Gamber Road is prohibited and is to be enforced by the county as well as State Highway Administration. Uh, the State Highway Administration has approved the entrance location with specific details included on the final plan as well as the record plat. So all lots are to be served by private well and septic systems. Uh, the project has received final plan approval from the Carroll County Health Department. And again, all lots are within compliance of the zoning ordinance. So this project was submitted to the county in April 22nd, 2019, and was subject to citizen involvement at the technical review committee meeting. During that meeting, the, there were no citizens that spoke, uh, and we have not received any written correspondence. Uh, the project was then presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission as a concept plan on July 21st, 2020. Uh, again, there were no citizens in attendance at that meeting. And more recently, the project was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan April 19th, 2022. Uh, the commission at the time decided to approve the preliminary plan. And again, there were no citizens at that meeting that were able to speak. Um, I will mention since this report has been written, I have received a few phone calls from some neighboring properties who did have some concerns uh, of traffic that this would create on Old Gamber Road, as well as uh, the congestion of houses on this property. So I'm gonna go back. I guess I gotta go back one more. So as you can see, Old Gamber Road it ties into Gamber Road, it loops up to serve those houses, and then it ties back into Gamber Road. So a lot of the comments I received was that there's not a lot of through traffic on this road except for those people that live off the road and have to use it to access their property. Um, and the addition of these six houses would cause additional congestion of traffic for those uh, current residents. So the property or the project itself is exempt from the requirements of floodplain management and water resource management. Uh, landscaping has granted preliminary and final approval with an approval of a variance requesting relief, uh, which was discussed at the previous meeting. And to give an idea uh, of what that was, the code stated that a dirt berm had to be run along Route 91. And um, within that variance, it was deemed that the landscaping that exists on the property as well as supplemental landscaping that is to be planted would be sufficient for the needs of uh, the use of the property. Forest Conservation has granted approval of the project with a variance uh, being approved for the removal of certain specimen trees on site. Grading and sediment control has granted approval of the final plan. Stormwater management has granted final approval of the project and dry wells and a wide shoulder along the driveways are proposed and will address those requirements of stormwater management. Uh, there will be two publicly owned stormwater management quantity control facilities that will be on the property. Uh, one will be accessed off of Old Gamber Road here and the other will be accessed off of Gamber Road down here. And finally, uh, the Department of Planning determined that the proposed plan is consistent with the 2014 Carroll County Master Plan land use designation of residential low density. Uh, so with that, pursuant to Chapter 155, staff recommends approval of the final plan subject to uh, the conditions outlined in the report, and I'll just briefly touch on those, uh, that a public works agreement um, is provided for the work that's to be done on the property that two declaration of maintenance obligations, one for each driveway is to be recorded, uh, that the parcels for stormwater management, parcels A and parcel C are to be conveyed to Carroll County, stormwater management easement and maintenance agreement is to be recorded, and finally a landscape maintenance agreement is granted to Carroll County for that landscaping that is to be planted on the property. So before I move on to concurrency management, uh, were there any questions for this first section of the report? Okay. So as mentioned, uh, back in April of 2022, the project was brought before the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan. Uh, pursuant to code, the project has to be tested for adequate facilities uh, when it's brought before the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan, which this project was. It was tested for schools, for police, for fire, for EMS, and for roads. 
During that time, schools, police, EMS, and roads facilities were found to be adequate. Uh, fire was the only facility that was deemed to be approaching inadequate. So accordingly, the Planning and Zoning Commission granted conditional approval uh, and it was to be retested uh, whenever they met those final plan requirements. So with that, the only agency that was retested was FIRE. And within the report, uh, I did provide some numbers. I do have more accurate numbers, uh, more recent numbers to provide. So between the two-year period for the Gamber Fire District, between March 2021 and April of 2023, The fire response for late and no responses was 13.23% and for no responses was 2.94%, which that is deemed adequate. For fire response time, the average response time over that same two year period is eight minutes and 34 seconds from dispatch to on site scene arrival with adequate um, apparatus and personnel and that is deemed approaching inadequate. So um, although there have been some items that have been done to help mitigate this issue throughout the county, not just in the Gamber area, because we are taking an average from that two year period, it is gonna take some time for those numbers to go down back below adequate. Um, but and just basing it off of the numbers that we ran last year and the numbers that we have this year, uh, that just now, uh, we do already see that trend of response time going down uh, as more personnel are hired on, more volunteers are coming back uh, this post-COVID era. So uh, with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission conditionally approve the final plan with the following conditions, that fire services are considered approaching inadequate that the building permit reservation is for six lots in fiscal year 2024, provided that the plat is recorded prior to any permits being issued, that the recordation schedule requires that the plat be recorded within 24 months of preliminary approval. The preliminary plan was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission April 19th, 2022, with a written approval date of May 24th, 2022. And finally, that the building permit reservation is allowed to roll over year after year until the sunset provision takes effect. Uh, so just to give a, a better idea as to how the site looks, these I believe are the same pictures that were provided last year to the Planning Zoning Commission. This is off of Old Gamber Road, looking up at the site, you can see the contours of the property and you can see the house uh, that no longer resides on the property. So this is at that driveway, that single use driveway that was used to serve the property. So if there's any other questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them, such as uh, uh, representatives of the project here. So I see um, the permit reservation is for one lot in fiscal year 24. Yes, yeah, so that was a, that was brought to my attention this morning that uh, that is to be six lots because they're proposing to create six lots um, it should be a building reservation for six instead of the one. So that was a typo on my part. It, it should be for six. Okay. So, okay. All right. Question about the shrubbery on the, on the road. I didn't see it listed. What, what types of plantings are they putting there? <clears throat> trees that are planted there are based on a type A screen, so they're going to be a series of evergreens, um, deciduous, and shrubs planted in the mixture with the, with the evergreens at the top of the slope and then the rest of them planted along. So it creates, over a period of time, and the size of them, it'll create a pretty dense area. It's just the house on that lot sits significantly higher than, than the bottom of the hill. And those, are, those trees are all specified on the final plans. Any other questions? No? No. Okay. Um, 
Is there any public wishing to speak? Okay. Okay, please speak into the microphone. Good morning, Commissioners. Ms. Kirkner, you may recognize me, I'm not sure. I'm Stephen Painter, I live with 2524 Four Leaf Drive. Oh. I am at the end of that lane. My concern is I'm not trying to hold up the development or anything like that. My concern is Four Leaf Drive itself. It's 12 foot wide, no access to turn around in anywhere other than my driveway or the neighbor's driveway. There's no bump out, so you can't pass on it. It's a one way in, one way out, no signage, it's private drive. So something needs to be done before you add three additional houses with all this extra traffic into this little lane. So I know you know where it's at, you've been there, but I know you can't comment on it. So that's the concerns I have. But I mean, as far as stopping progress, selling the lots or anything, I have no issues with that. It's just something needs to be done for that access road to be able to pass Right now, you cover, somebody comes into the lane, somebody's coming out as a knoll, so you can't see from the top what's coming in at the bottom. You get there in the middle, somebody either has to pull off in the grass or back up one way or the other. Then backing up on the old Gamber Road is not really safe. And as far as traffic on that road, there is a lot of traffic on that. Right now, they're using that traffic, I mean, that road has an access point because they're paving 91. All these asphalt trucks are going making a loop around there at night because they're doing it during the night as far as the property itself my opinion it's not being maintained the guy mows it twice a year June he'll probably do it again in September I mow up both sides of the lane I mow the area on the top where it's flat where somebody's house front yard is going to be there right now people are using that to turn around in and it's full of Johnson grass we all brought it up before and my yard is covered with Johnson grass because it's not being maintained. So that's all I had to say. Okay. Appreciate you listening. Could, Thank you. Could I ask the gentleman a question? <coughs> Are you part of the Houston Common driveway then? Or, yes. Or just so it's you and another neighbor. So right now there's two houses on there. Okay. And there's going to be three additional houses in there. So that's say 10 vehicles coming in and out constantly you can't really my house is the the one at the bottom of the picture there on the right yeah that's it okay so right now that that road is a dead end but there's going to be a, additionally a house built there at that end that's going to be their driveway so there's no access to turn around anywhere other than my driveway or the neighbor's driveway if it had a bump out or something at least you could pass on it <laughs> Yeah. I, so there will be three other houses on in that your, same lane. your driveway with no condition for turnaround or pull-off area. That's your concern. Yes. And, I mean, it's 12 foot wide. My truck's 7 foot wide. There's no way you could pass. Yeah. And, and, and bringing in big construction equipment on this, this road is not public, so whatever gets tore up, we have to maintain it. And the road is already in bad shape. The blacktop itself is getting cracked and wavy. And I don't know exactly when it's built. I bought my house in December of 2020, not knowing any of this was going to happen in the future. I had no idea of that. But. So I do know when the uh, plan came before the commission previously, there was some conversation about the five lots being on there. Mm -hmm. And um, the county said that that was allowed, allowable there. Um, and there was a question about the fire turnaround, and I don't think that was required. Am I correct, David? So ultimately, we do have, or I should say, so when this project was submitted to the county, there was a different code that was in place at the time. And so as this progressed through the review process, it's still being reviewed under that different code. There was a threshold put in place that said once you, your driveway gets a certain length, that's when we have that bump out, uh, and that's when we also have a turnaround area. And neither one of these driveways had reached that threshold. So there wasn't any code requirement to have those put in place. And that's not to say 
They couldn't have been put in place, but there is no code requirement that said they were forced to put those in place. And as you, uh, as you stated, I also recall having discussion as to um, the turnaround at the, at the end of these driveways. And um, regardless of that discussion that occurred back then, I, the, the, the Planning and Zoning Commission did approve it without any type of condition to change that. What length does it have to be to provide it? So previous code, I believe it was 500 feet uh, in which those would have to be put in place. What's being shown is a four-leaf drive, which is a 450-foot long driveway, and then the other driveway, which is Clover Drive, will be 266 feet long. Forty feet shy of the requirement to have a turnaround. Yeah, I can tell you, UPS truck, Amazon trucks come in their deliveries. They have a heck of a time trying to turn around. They're actually using the grass, which will be somebody's front yard eventually to turn around. Yeah, um, I guess Miss Miller, um, Linda, any chance of? some type of mitigation there to help with that. I'll ask Linda to speak to the specifics, but briefly I will say that the drive width that's proposed is meets the requirements. It is the 12 feet. And as Mr. Beecraft pointed out, um, it, it does meet all of the county criteria here. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I'll let, Linda's been obviously much more involved technically on this plan, so I'll let her speak to yeah, any turnaround. We had, uh, quite, I remember this, we had quite a bit of discussion. Uh, Pete probably remembers that yep. he and I were about fire and you know it's 12 feet wide and that's the requirement and our concern was getting the equipment in and out uh, turn around uh, but unfortunately the code being the code it's allowable. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, David and Linda, but I think Fryer also does look at the access as well, not just uh, the, separate from the 12 foot requirements of the right. specific code. So I think maybe the concerns about the turnaround in our, of other vehicles, um, private vehicles, mm -hmm. if you will. I guess what concerns me is that um, the gentleman has no problem with the development itself but I'm concerned about the unintended consequences here for he and his neighbor who's already been there with this traffic business. And I know that 12 feet's not very wide for anything to pass on. Um, there are a lot of vehicles coming in now, these developments now with Amazon, UPS drivers, parcel drivers and all. And that that's a concern I don't it just seems like there should be some mitigation here to alleviate what looks like more than a potential problem but a, a real problem that's going to exist to existing neighbors and and that that bothers me um, you know neighborhoods are grown on trust and and being good neighbors to mm -hmm. each other but when you start driving into the next guy's lawn or turning around when it's muddy if it ever gets muddy um i have a problem i just seems like it seems to me like there should be a way to mitigate this potential problem here which is going to be a real problem just a thought i i would hope that it would be better than than putting a sign in his in his lawn to say don't turn around on my lawn that's not a very good Solutions. Yeah. It's not a solution at all. Okay, so the use in common that's there is based on 12 foot wide and the code that um, was in place at the time this was approved. 12 foot. And that. These, there is also a use in common agreement over top of this driveway that was put in place prior to those two homes being purchased that stated at that time that there was at least two more homes that were gonna be on this driveway, okay? Um, I grant you that these houses back there are tight. Um, to when those other driveways go in, what we have proposed on the, on, and what the builder intends to build on these houses are double wide driveways and, and that type of stuff that hopefully would facilitate some of that 
if an Amazon truck comes in, he's got room to turn around in some of those driveways. This meets the code. We are two, three years in on the design that's shown on here. Storm orders approved. Any additional changes or any additional paving would have to go back before um, at least three or four agencies through the county to, put in, to increase any type of paving out here. It's a quantity issue, quality. I mean, it's just, you know, even some of the storm order on this was approved prior to mm -hmm. some of the more updated policy changes. I understand his concerns and we could talk about with the developer, you know, maybe there, and as far as the pavement that's on here, the intention is once these houses are built, there's gonna have to be a surface course put on that. So any damage that happens to that driveway when these, when these homes go in is gonna be fixed prior, before those homes are, completely sold. I'm not 100% sure that there's a base or a surface course pavement out here. So any type of heavy equipment that's coming in to build those homes, the builder is going to be responsible for repairing that driveway when he goes back out. The entrance on this is going to be widened out based on the state's requirements and there's going to be a parking pad or a trash pad and some other additional items added to this use in common that are not currently there in the field that allows for a, a more of a passing you know type of thing maybe there's something that we can look at i can talk to the, the developer about maybe when actually the construction of these houses happen maybe a pullover or something could be added somewhere you know what i mean like maybe not there's not room for a turnaround these wells are drilled all the wells in this property are drilled and, and, and a lot of those wells are right back around where a turnaround would have went in at that point in time so um, it becomes tight to do that, but we can always discuss the possibility, possibility, I'm not saying it can happen, of potentially trying to add, you know, some addition, like a pullover or something like he was saying at the top of the hill. It's just this late in the game. I've got to, you know, <laughs> we were here because of fire. We're, we were not necessarily here for the final plans. Yeah. Everybody signed off. Any type of change to those plans goes back through. I understand that the good, you went by code. I understand yeah. that, and and that's all well and good. But there should be some good neighbor policy that goes along with it. And I can see some potential problems here, so that they are everyone is a good neighbor in this potential um, development here, and not add to a problem. So I will say that that driveway is not being used for any of the construction of the site itself. So anything that's happening interior to the site as far as any of the storm order and, and the other building of that use in common and anything that's happening in the state, they are not using that use in common. That use in common would only be used to construct the actual private house that's going on. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Robertson, I'll chime in real quickly after Linda to say that the only intent here is to be a good neighbor. Um, I've worked with these clients for years and I can, I can say that three times over. Um, the, uh, I think what Linda expressed is what I'll emphasize, which is today's review was focused, again, on the fire emergency services aspect. Um, and I, we have taken this into consideration, and they have thought about this in the design. Um, I'm, I'm f personally familiar with many shared driveways like this. Um, there can be times where, yes, there can be two people trying to come. It's, it's inevitable. Um, but for the most part, I'm also familiar with one that works pretty well. And I think that the, this was not necessarily unanticipated, uh, given that the maintenance obligations existed to add additional lots back here. It was always contemplated that there were going to be additional lots back here. So that was, um, you know, it was never the intent for this to be a surprise. We're adding additional um, traffic to a lane that was never anticipated to have that. I don't want anybody to think that that was kind of what occurred here. Okay. Any additional comments? Or anything I could possibly think of, maybe to the right, as you shoot at the right angle, coming up the driveway from my house, there's like a bump out going to the left. There's additional room there to the right. You could possibly put a bump out there because the way I guess the, the paper's laid out, there is an access there. It's part of my property and a neighbor, Mr. Prophet's property. That would be the only thing widening that road next side. Other than that, I mean, I know there's no way to put like a cul-de-sac in there. There's just no room whatsoever. 
But I'm sorry I didn't make the last meeting. My work schedule didn't allow me to be here, but I did watch the videos on time. I knew you talked about it and brought it up, but it is a concern, and I know it's not going to get away. It's just going to get worse. That's all I had to say, really. Okay. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Hearing none, um, gentlemen. I'll make a motion, but I am going to make an editorial comment um, okay. first, which you know, we've been talking about these use in common driveways for several years now, and, and I think things have changed um, to where, you know, with, with FedEx, Amazon, UPS, all of those things, um, I think the the days of 300 foot long, 500 foot long use in common driveways with no turnaround, I think they're limited. And I think we as a county need to address the fact that people's lifestyles have changed a little bit. And not only that, the density of the county, while we're still rural and we like where we live, as, as we get more and more dense, just being able to accommodate people coming home from work deliveries being dropped off and emergency vehicles which we have talked about i mean commissioner wants before you tom i mean he was you know he was big on the the, the emergency vehicle and support of those first responders I, i'm rattling on um I, I think there's some things that we need to do to tighten this up so that we can continue to develop lots like this infill lots you know and and utilize properties like this but we need to do a better job of infrastructure and supporting it. Having said that, I think these people have done everything they're supposed to do, everything they're required to do. Um, if there's something more they can do, um, I, I hope the county will work with them. Having said all of that, I move, move that we approve uh, this as drawn um, and recommended by the staff with the four stipulations uh, with with the the mindset that stipulation two will correctly state six lots um, as it was intended um, that's my motion okay um, do you want to include chapter 155 or should that be separate Jim uh, yes one you should take a motion on chapter 155 approval and then a separate uh, motion and vote on the chapter 156 okay. approval. Do you want to go backwards on 155 first? Sure. I'll move okay. we approve subject to uh, 155. Okay. And the six uh, recommendations. Okay. A second. Okay. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any change? Okay. All right. Now so. I'll go to the uh, addressing uh, 156 with the revision on uh, with subject to the four stipulations made by staff, revising with the one edit being that we revise and note that it's not one lot but six. Okay. Second. Awesome. Okay. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. It stands approved. Um, you can have your building permits finally in 24. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the item 12, final subdivision plan. FX 23001 Crystal Springs Section 2. Groundhog Day. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I need a shorter chair. I can't touch. Me too. <laughs> D 
David, I believe you're up again. That is correct. So David B. Kraft with the Bureau of Development Review uh, with the last project on the docket this morning, which is Crystal Springs, Section 2, file number FX230001. Uh, with me are a few representatives of the project who I will let introduce themselves. Hi, I'm CLSI. Uh, yeah, listen to me. I'm CLSI. I'm Linda Alexander with CLSI. I'm the engineer on the project. Rebecca Daneman, I'm the personal representative of the estate of Geneva Brown, and the estate of Geneva Brown owns the property. And similar to the last project, this is before the Planning Zoning Commission as a final subdivision plan, uh, uh, almost a duplicate uh, of what the situation is, is that this went before the Planning Zoning Commission a lot more recent than the last one. I, I believe it was March of this year. It was before the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan, and it received approval of the preliminary plan that time, at that time. Uh, however, Chapter 156, Concurrency Management, had one or two facilities that were approaching inadequate. Uh, so we're back before the Planning Zoning Commission as a final plan uh, with the retest of those facilities. So even though this project was back uh, was brought before the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan only a few months ago. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar or may not remember, uh, the project is up towards the Tawny Town area. This is Route 140 down here. This is Tyrone Road, and here is Cross Section Road. So the address of the property itself is 2341 Cross Section Road, Westminster, Maryland, 21158. Um, and I guess as a formality, I should say, so as mentioned, this is before the Planning Zoning Commission. As a final plan, we are looking for two actions this morning. Uh, approval on the final plan of subdivision pursuant to Chapter 155 and conditional approval of the final plan of subdivision pursuant to Chapter 156. So the project itself, the property was once comprised of just shy of 70 acres. It had two off conveyances that were taken back in 19, the 1990s. Uh, and then there was section one, which took three lots on the south side of Cross Section Road, which was recorded in 1996. This left the area outlined as the remaining portion, which is roughly 38, 39 acres. Uh, the remaining portion currently hosts a private residence, as you can see shown here. Uh, there are a few outbuildings associated with that property. Uh, the property itself is outside the property and funding area, as well as a designated growth area. The surrounding properties to the north, south, and east are all zoned agriculture, and they are improved with single-family residences. The adjoining property to the west is also zoned agriculture, but it is currently unimproved. The subject property and all surrounding properties are currently served by private well and septic systems. So not much has changed since the property was brought before the Planning Zoning Commission a few months back. They are still proposing just one lot of subdivision, which is lot number four. Uh, <coughs> the property itself that they're proposing will be 1.51 acres, and it will have direct access on the cross-section road. After this lot is recorded, the remaining portion, which would then be just over 37 acres, will not be entitled to the creation of any more residential lots. Uh, a note outlining this has been added to the, the plat, which is to be recorded. So the concept subdivision plan was initially submitted January 25th of 2021. It went to the Technical Review Committee meeting uh, February 22nd of 2021. There's no citizens at that meeting, but there were a few citizens that reached out to find out what was happening on the property, uh, but they did not provide any opposition. On March 21st, 2023, the Planning Zoning Commission reviewed and approved the concept slash preliminary plan uh, of subdivision. No citizens signed in or spoke at that meeting, and since that meeting, I have not heard any, anything from any uh, residents in the area um, in reference to this project. So the project itself is exempt from landscaping and floodplain requirements. Water resource management, soil conservation, zoning, grading, and sediment control have all granted final approval of the plan. Forest conservation is to be addressed with a forest conservation easement on the remaining portion that is shown up in this area. Engineering review has reviewed and approved the plan with the approval of a site distance variant of the, the new driveway that's proposed. 
The Carroll County Health Department and the Bureau of Utilities have approved the plan with on-site well and septic proposed. Stormwater management has granted final approval of the plan. Uh, stormwater management will be achieved by way of an infiltration berm, which will be shown here and will discharge onto the remaining portion. Uh, this will require a right to discharge agreement that I believe has already been recorded. And finally, uh, the Department of Planning determined that the proposed plan is consistent with the 2014 uh, Carroll County Master Plan land use designation of agriculture. So with that, the staff recommends approval pursuant to Chapter 155, uh, really with only three conditions. Uh, one is that a stormwater management easement and maintenance agreement be recorded. The second is a forest conservation easement is granted to the Carroll County. And finally, that any changes to the preliminary plan um, as submitted and approved by the commission shall be resubmitted for further review and approval. So before I move on to the concurrency aspect of things, were there any questions in reference to? No? Okay. So moving on to concurrency management, similar to the last project, when this was brought before the Planning Zoning Commission as a preliminary plan, um, the available facilities were tested for adequacy. And those facilities were for schools, police, fire, EMS, and roads. During that testing, schools, police, and roads were found to be adequate. Fire and EMS was found to be approaching inadequate. Accordingly, Planning Zoning Commission granted conditional approval of the preliminary plan under Chapter 156. This is back before the Planning Zoning Commission as a final plan. It has since been retested only for fire and EMS services as that was the, or those two were the only facilities that were deemed approaching inadequate at the time. So uh, the property itself is located in the Pleasant Valley Fire and EMS District. The most recent data provided by the Office of Public Safety for the two year period of June 2021 to May 2023 uh, state that late and no response statistical data that of the first due total fire calls in the Pleasant Valley District, 2.22 were categorized as no responses and 12.22 as late and no responses. Uh, of the first due emergency medical services, 0.78 were categorized as no responses and 1% as late and no responses. Pleasant Valley is rated adequate for late and no response criteria for fire and EMS. With regard to fire call average response time for the same two year period, Pleasant Valley had an average response time of eight minutes and 51 seconds, which is deemed approaching inadequate. With regards to emergency medical call average response time, Pleasant Valley had an average response time of nine minutes and 41 seconds, which is also approaching inadequate. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, services are rated approaching inadequate if when utilizing an average over the past 24 months, response time is between 8 and 10 minutes from time of dispatch to on-site arrival. So a similar scenario to the previous project, actually even more so with the, the lapse of preliminary and final testing, uh, when you have an average over two years, retesting after four or so months is not really going to to make much of a difference unless your response time goes down to 30 seconds. So um, with that, staff recommends conditional approval pursuant to Chapter 156, uh, noting that fire and EMS are considered approaching inadequate, that the building permit reservation is for one lot in fiscal year 2024, provided that the plat is recorded prior to any permits being issued that the recordation schedule require the plat to be recorded within 24 months of the preliminary plan approval, uh, having been approved by the Planning Zoning Commission on March 21st, 2023. A written approval had a date of March 29th, 2023. And finally, the building permit reservation is allowed to roll over year after year until the sunset provision takes a place. So uh, for those who want a reminder as to how the project looks, these are just a few shots of where that proposed driveway is going to be located or whereabouts. Uh, this is just looking both ways on cross section road. This is looking at the site, or I'm sorry, this is on the site looking at the road. And this is just a shot of a further back on the site uh, in a general area as to where the house may be placed. So if there's any questions, uh, any concerns, I'd be happy to answer them or the representatives here with me today. Just, 
just to educate myself, um, could you tell me on the 36 acre remaining portion, what, what is that subject to in the future as far as lot yield? So with this lot, with this being number four, they're tapped out. Okay. Uh, unless the property is rezoned or unless there's a change in the provision of code, uh, they're not allowed any further residential lots. I understood that to be the case. I just wanted you to reiterate that. Now, that's not to say they, uh, the remaining couldn't add a, a detached accessory dwelling. Uh, it, it would be on the same property. It wouldn't be split off, but they could add a second house on the property subject to... On the remaining portion. On the remaining portion. Okay. Um, Ms. Alexander, do you have anything? No, we agree with the staff. We're just here to answer any questions. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any public that would like to comment? Okay. Seeing none. Wait, she, I'd like, I'd like to make a comment. I'm not public, but um, I just want to reiterate what I'd said before. I guess is that this this property is it's a beautiful lot, and it involves an estate where my mother died in 2019 and we we started on this process in 2020 so it's been three years in the in the making and we cannot settle the estate until the disposition of this lot is taken care of and uh, and I'm encouraged that the county has been proactive in dealing with their emergency services and they have a good plan and they've started implementing it and whatnot so I don't feel that the um, almost inadequate situation is going to be an issue um, so I hope that I hope I appreciate you seeing us today and um, I hope that we can resolve this pretty quickly so we can get on with the estate settlement thank you okay thank you um, all right would someone like to make a motion for chapter 155 and chapter 156 sure yeah. you want to go yeah go ahead uh, yeah, I'll make the recommendation that we approve this uh, according to Chapter 155 with the three final, the three conditions. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second for approving Chapter 155 for FX 23001 Crystal Springs Section 2. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that is approved. Um, and then chapter 156. That's a, uh, says conditional approval? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll make the recommendation for the uh, conditional approval uh, according to chapter 156 with uh, the four recommendations from staff. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for one chapter 156. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right. You are approved to go, and I know it's been a journey, but <laughs> congratulations. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, um, we are at. Where are we? we are at recess. <laughs> recess 13. Let's take um, five. five minutes. Yes. Yeah.
by tomorrow. All right. We are going to go back in session here. Mm -hmm. um, so we are moving along. We are at item number 14, adult use cannabis, Mary Lane and Hannah Weber. You're up. Thank you. Um, just as an overview of the next six items, we're bringing six text amendments that were referred by at various times by the um, Board of County Commissioners per the zoning code to you for your review and comment. Um, our anticipation today is not that you vote them out. It is meant to be an introduction and discussion. But if there are any that you feel ready to vote out, you could do that. Um, there are varying degrees of complexity. There's a couple that you might feel comfortable making a recommendation on. This is not going to be one of them, probably. <laughs> so I'm going to let Hannah start with that. Thank you. OK. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you can see, the first text amendment up is the adult use cannabis. Um, this was referred by the Board of County Commissioners on April 20th. This amendment is being discussed because of the new Maryland legislation. Um, the new legislation expands legalization of what was previously only medical cannabis to adult use cannabis to residents 21 years or older. And at the April 20th meeting with the county commissioners, they gave some direction to prohibit on-site consumption and to restrict the cannabis dispensaries as much as possible. And we'll get into more detail on that. So currently, we do um, have medical cannabis in language in our zoning code. Dispensaries for medical cannabis are permitted in the C2 and C3 district. Facilities for dispensing of medical cannabis in conjunction with a cannabis growing and or processing facility are permitted in the I1 and I2 district. We also have distance requirements and specific regulations um, for medical cannabis in our zoning code. So the distance requirements for medical cannabis is they must be 400 feet from any lot in a residential district and 400 feet from any lot less than three acres in the ag and conservation district. Under the general regulations for growing, processing, and dispensing facilities, outdoor growing of medical cannabis is prohibited in all districts. All lighting shall comply with site plan requirements. Site plans require planning commission approval and no variances from this section or the distance requirements shall be granted. So just looking high level at the new Maryland legislation, um, it permits the selling, growing, and processing of adult use cannabis in the state of Maryland. Current medical dispensaries could apply to be converted to an adult use and a standard medical dispensary. The legislation gives zoning authority to jurisdictions with the tag of political subdivisions may not establish zoning or other requirements that unduly burden the cannabis licensee. And that is where we are having a lot of hardship in trying to figure out what unduly burden actually means to the state. Jurisdictions also have the authority to prohibit on-site consumption establishments, and that was the direction that the Board of County Commissioners would like to go into. Um, on-site consumption establishments are entities licensed to distribute cannabis and cannabis products for on-site consumption, and this legislation went into effect on July 1st. So next steps. We have no medical dispensaries in the county. Um, there are some in the municipalities, but at the county there are no medical dispensaries. So with that being said, the state is doing two different licensing rollouts in 2024. On January 1st, 2024, they are giving um, the licenses to social equity applicants only. And then on May 1st, 2024, is another rollout for all applicants. So that's when we would like to have something in our zoning code by May 1st, 2024. So we have some options. Um, wait on state for clarification and zoning. Um, this will be the staff recommendation as we are not sure what unduly burden um, means. We can mirror the zoning regulations for medical cannabis for the adult use cannabis. We can move forward with prohibiting on-site consumption. This will require additional language to definitions, use tables, and et cetera. And this also, no licenses for on-site consumption will be distributed until May 1st, 2024. 
And then the last option is we can work on creating new zoning regulations for cannabis dispensaries altogether. So that's it for my presentation. Um, I guess open up for questions. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question, but can we get an electronic version? Absolutely. Of that? Okay. Thank you. So, any questions, gentlemen? So, do we want to take public comment for each one individually? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And lastly, did anybody see my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> glasses to find my glasses oh. okay I had them <laughs> I'll find them <laughs> okay um, any public comment on adult use cannabis okay seeing none um, we can move on to item 15 farm alcohol producer food production Mary we'll Lane. need some direction on um, what you guys would like to do. Oh, well, I'm taking oh. that to mean you want to wait until we get a little more clarification. Right. Clarification okay. from the zoning yes. board. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and we probably won't have that by the next meeting, um, August 15th, because there's going to be a lot of discussion about this down in Ocean City at Mako. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are not alone in this. There's confusion by a lot of yeah. the counties and waiting for answers. And we've actually been working with Mako staff in developing questions that we would like the new newly formed commission to get back to us with and it's not just dispensaries it's growing and processing there's a lot of vagueness in the law right Good. now yeah. from I our would, perspective in, in drafting like a zoning clarification and I'm, maybe i missed this but there are no there are growers in Carroll county now right there i don't one. think yeah. no, i many. think there's one in yeah. tawny in tawny yeah. town yeah. but i think yeah. that's okay, so that's a municipality correct mm -hmm. so you referred so there are no growers or dispensaries outside of any municipality correct okay so, so that's another reason so they can determine their own correct uses and their own okay yep I just want to clarify and that's also why we have some time to wait because there's nothing going to be affected by any new language we put in so any municipality then could have individuals right. unique live in that having access to from my understanding you could they can't give a new license out it was only for medical dispensaries before and then you they would had to have applied to be involved in the adult use but if you say if you had like a vacant building and you wanted to do an adult use dispensary there you wouldn't be able to get a license until May 1st 2024 and you could yeah well then you can yeah. apply for so you can apply all for regulations it. Regulations have to be formed, and that's why. So it's determined then by the county and the zoning if if you can have a grower in the county, but not a dispensary in the county. Can you? No, you, you can. You can do one or the other if the zoning laws would allow it. I mean, or well, for you medical, it, you. I mean, can you do the whole nine yards in the county? You will be if, if you, you meet if you, the other requirements. Yeah. So, right, so the dispensaries are. You can have a drive, are, a drive through out in the middle of Wakefield Valley. <laughs> no, you got to be in right now. No, I'm, I'm talking to. But if it's determined, then the law allows whatever the county decides to do in that respect. Whatever's in the zoning code, yeah. But right now, this, we only allow the dispensaries in the commercial districts or the industrial districts. So, so what I'm trying to determine is what what this new law allows the county. You know, yeah, I, and I we, want us to do our own thing. And yeah, be required to, yeah. to do all this stuff if we right. don't want to. Yeah, and that's another reason we would like to hold off until we get more. Okay. Yeah. There are a lot of questions, aren't there? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So we can move on to item 15. And like before, if we can get the electronic version of all these, that'd be yeah. great. So um, the second text amendment under consideration is farm alcohol producer food production. 
Um, in 2018, the Board of County Commissioners adopted an ordinance which established regulations for food, I'm sorry, farm alcohol producers in Carroll County. I would point out this was a very extended process that involved all the, the Farm Bureau, um, all kinds of players in this, and it um, went through a lot of work sessions and such. But um, these regulations place limitations on the type of food served in conjunction with tours and tastings. This is basically at wineries to being only those ready for service and in a state generally ready for consumption, so prepackaged. So then in 2023, the Maryland General Assembly adopted SB 322, allowing for the preparation of certain foods in conjunction with class four wineries, making the current zoning regulations inconsistent with the new state law. So on May 4th, the Board of County Commissioners referred this as part of um, another referral that they gave us to the Planning Commission for your review. Um, currently, farm alcohol producer is defined as a farm that grows and processes, stores, and or sells agricultural products for the production of wine, beer, brandy, juice, or other similar beverage on an on-site producing vineyard, orchard, hop yard, or similar growing area, and it is a conditional use in both the ag and conservation districts with some um, additional regulations. So there's a number of additional regulations that came out of that work group that I talked about when this was first adopted. And this is the current language regarding um, tours and tastings. And I'm not going to read all that, but it's it basically what we're looking at here is number three, the food arrives at the establishment ready for service or in a state generally ready for consumption. So what we're proposing is to make our code in line with the new state law, which changes it to be the farm alcohol producer may prepare, sell, and serve food in accordance with the provisions <coughs> outlined in the farm alcohol producer's state license and must also obtain appropriate licensing and approvals from the Carroll County Health Department. We're also proposing, and you see where the strikeout language is, it's deleted language. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, even though number three, the food arriving ready for service or in a state generally ready for consumption is what we're trying to get rid of, um, on a staff level, we also discuss taking out one and two because really they're not enforceable. Um, it's just difficult to determine if something is secondary and complementary. So the, our recommendation would be to take those all, all of that language out and replace it just that it be in accordance with the state law and the Carroll County Health Department. Um, that's all we have on that one. This is one that if you felt comfortable doing this, you, you could um, refer back out to the um, Board of County Commissioners to start moving because the process from here on then is that they would set it for public hearing um, and then advertise a public hearing, hold a public hearing and vote and all that takes a little bit of time and there are actually um, wineries that could use this to become in compliance. Mm -hmm. so it, I don't know if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to discuss it more. We have nothing else to bring to you unless you have I any guess, other information you would want. Yeah, I, my only question is I, I saw something, you know, that was where we're going to be talking about restaurants and ag. That's going to be different. I think that's, that's next. That's actually. different than this. And so we, if, because I have no problem with this. Uh, I don't mean to, you know, I, I, I think it makes sense to to move it on up. I just want to make sure that we're not going to have to rehash this when we talk about restaurants. No, and that's why we separated it out. The commissioner okay. sent the whole concept to you, but we decided this one was yeah. an easier one to get out and required fewer um, fewer meetings for discussion. Yeah, this, this, is, this makes sense to me because um, I, I I don't go to a ton of wineries, but where I where I have you know whether they have food trucks or whatever, it just makes some sense. It's helpful to have that there. Agreed. Agreed. If you would like to. Is there a, I make a motion. Do we have any public Do you comment? Public comment? Oh. Public comment? Yes, no. Okay. I mean, we can take public comment if it's there. Okay. <laughs> Is there any public comment on the farm? Alcohol producer? No? Okay. Seeing none. Richard? Make a motion that we do delete the language and put in the new language. 
And a favorable recommendation of that yes. concept to the Board of County Commission. Board Commission. I second that. Okay. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Off to the commissioner as it goes. All right. Good luck. Item 16, restaurants in the agricultural district. So you're a little head, <laughs> but this is, um, as Mary said, the second part of what the commissioners originally forwarded to you all. Um, this was referred by the county commissioners on May 4th, and it was to review restaurants in the agriculture district. Um, just kind of a summary of the text amendment. Restaurants are currently not allowed in the ag or conservation zone. A recent BZA case certified a restaurant as an accessory use to a driving range in the ag zone. Golfing industries often have accessory restaurants to their main use. In the zoning code, we defined an accessory use as a use of land or all or part of a building which is customarily incidental and secondary to the principal use of the property and which is located on the same lot with the principal use. Restaurant, restaurants are a principal permitted use in um, the C1, C2, C3, and employment campus district. So they are not an accessory use in those districts. So pulling applicable zoning code language for this discussion, the outdoor recreational area we have defined as a commercially operated outdoor recreation or entertainment facility, including but not limited to miniature golf course, skating rink, ball field, swimming pool, tennis court, paintball center, golf driving, or batting range. And then we have a golf course defined as an area of land laid out for playing golf with a series of holes, each including a tee, fairway, and putting green, and often one or more natural or artificial hazards. So golf courses and outdoor recreational areas are a conditional use in the agriculture and conservation districts. Um, in the distance requirements, golf courses must be at least 200 feet from any lot in a residential district, any residential lot of less than three acres in the ag or conservation district, and then they must have a minimum separation of 300 feet from dwellings on a lot more than three acres. And then golf courses also require site plan and an environmental impact plan approval. So the staff recommendation is to revise the definition of outdoor recreation area to remove golf driving. We revise the definition of golf course to include golf driving range and then add to chapter 158, 169, which is the additional regulations for golf courses to allow restaurants as a co-located conditional use to golf courses and driving ranges. That's all we have for this. Okay, um, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a rant here. So Do with this, me. bring it. Um, I'm familiar with the, with the golf driving range uh, situation and just give you a little background on that. Uh, at one time that was a farm so it's in the ag zone. The owner was allowed to develop that farm, take all the lots off, and then you had a remaining portion. So the, so the first thing that happened on that parcel was a church established was established there, and it was allowed in the ag zone, part of 50 some other things that are allowed in the ag zone. Um, and the next thing that happened then is <coughs> Uh, the church needed an accessory dwelling there. So there's one more residential house was put on that parcel. Then came the golf driving range, which was allowed in the ag zone. Then came um, the need for a hot dog stand because everybody gets hungry when they're driving a golf ball <laughs> and they needed something to drink. So that was allowed. And then the next thing that was allowed was a restaurant happened to want, to want to be there, which was part of all this. And then after that, in the ag zone now, where there is residential development in different areas around it, it became an entertainment venue where uh, 
people came in and, and sang and danced and carried on, and that was allowed, or it was allowed <coughs> after it happened. So this was an example of um, let's do it and then get a permission afterwards. Mm -hmm. So these, these are the things that bother me, the erosion of our ag zone. And we slowly and, and deliberately start to erode the ag zone and this parcel is, is like the prime example of what can happen when, when one thing leads to another and then the owners do it and then they ask permission later. Mm -hmm. And then we're, we're so far down the road that we sit here and say, well, you know, the guy spent $250,000 put his restaurant in and, and another $100,000 to bring in uh, um, Joe Blow to to uh, entertain and it's disrupting the neighborhoods and it's eroding our ag zone. Um, this bothers me because I just see it happening time and time again. A lot of this I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against. I know there, there are uses that are allowed out there, but as you move down the line, we're continually <coughs> eroding and eroding and eroding and um, I'm not sure where it's gonna stop. I would love to see a review of the uses in the ag zone by the, directed by the commissioners just to, to understand what is allowed. And I think you'd be amazed at the amount of, well, I think you know, I'm not <coughs> assuming you don't. But I don't think the public knows how many things are allowed in the ag zone that, that undermines the intent of the agricultural zoning and that that has bothered a lot of people for a lot of years instead of adding to the uses permitted and conditional in the ag zone maybe we better start looking at at some of these things and, and say does this really comply with the intent of our zoning well i do think as we established a lot of this previously, some of that is spelled out as to what can be allowed in some of these zones. Um, but I do agree. We probably need to look at that. But um, I think here we have the staff recommendation. Is this something we can push back up to the commissioners um, to say, you know, like just like with your previous yeah, one favorable or unfavorable recommendation of so, okay. so what do you what do you describe as outdoor recreation um, a four-wheeler track um, well this recommendation is not for all outdoor recreation it'll just be removing the um, golf driving range from this definition definition and putting it in the golf course definition so the only place where a restaurant can be co-located in the ag zone and conservation zone would be with a golf course or a driving range it wouldn't open it up to all of these uses in the outdoor recreation definition and does that limit I'm sorry did you have anything else to say oh no you're good and does that to, to his point, the unintended consequences of this, you know, where the operation, you know, it's great that somebody's successful and is attracting people to, to you know, it's attra an attractive place to be. At the same time, the surrounding neighbors, you know, do, how, how do we limit that activity that is in conjunction with the restaurant to indoor activity or, um, I, I, and we're coming back to noise, right? Because we're, 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 the, the outdoor concerts, or you have some, you have a wine and cheese thing outside with a guy playing a guitar. Again, I'm, I, I'm all for music. I love it, and I like these kinds of venues. I'm just concerned about the neighbors and the erosion, right, of 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 what ag is. So, how do we do that? Um, a part of our recommendation is to make this a conditional use okay. to allow it to go through the BZA process and that'll allow for more public input and conditions to be put on the use. Um, as well as its own site plan then because yeah. now it's not any longer 
allowed to be considered an accessory use in those golf venues. It has to be a principal use, which means it needs a site plan. But so, in answer to your bigger question, it doesn't solve the problem you're talking about for anything other than the golf. We haven't addressed any other outdoor recreational activity. And then the and I'll say and I'll, I'll shut up. One of the other things that I think as a commission we've been frustrated by is we do things here and we have something in mind, and then the BZA does other things. And so I'd kind of like to, like to tighten it up here so that the BZA has. A, f a more f a fuller understanding of what we intended well it's just and I'm not I'm not trying to pick on this, <coughs> this gentleman that has the golf or the lady or the family that has a golf uh, venue but if and, and this is fact if you invite someone like Lee Greenwood in on 4th of July to sing America and all how do we know how many it could be 20,000 people show up or it could be 4,000 or 800. So how, how do you even begin to r regulate that kind of a thing in the ag zone where there's not sufficient roads to cover something like that? And so we just, we, you know, I'm gonna stop right now, but um, it just keeps eroding and eroding the quality of, and the culture that we've tried to initiate here and to hold our zoning in place, which has made Carroll County the desirable place for people to come and do all these things. Um, and and that's, that concerns me greatly. Yeah. Um, I'm all for entrepreneurship, believe me. I, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe the place you're talking about the surrounding property, while there's still some ag to, has been developed with houses. Um, I know I've been to that place a couple of times. I, I do believe there's probably a time limit for um, any outdoor music that they usually have, um, just like the wedding venues. Well, and that's um. So that we have a uh, temporary, uh, I guess, zoning use uh, certificate process, um, which was the situation with the concert at Island Green, where they applied for um, basically a temporary zoning certificate in order to allow that event to happen. And as part of approval for that temporary zoning certificate, it needs to go through uh, a number of agencies to sign off, including roads, police, the health department, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there are some, um, okay. I guess, guardrails um, with that respect to having large events in the ag zone, and that's uh, governed by our temporary zoning certificate process. And then in this case, it would be governed by if the BZA wanted to put additional conditions on it as a conditional use. So right now it's considered an accessory use, and that's harder to regulate. A conditional use, the BZA has the opportunity to limit the number, the duration, that type of thing. And again, if the, uh, the entity or the property owner is you know, out of compliance with those conditions, then that conditional use approval can be withdrawn. There you go. Okay. Um, Okay, so what is our pleasure? Do you want to move it up with a favorable or unfavorable? Or we can bring it back on the yeah. 15th if you want the month to think about it. I mean, we're not pushing this. Uh, I would oh. make a motion that we uh, a favorable to the staff recommendation. To go to the Board of Commissioners. Do we want to have public comment first before any vote? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, here come. Uh, uh, Bill McCormick, real quick, just to clarify, this is only for ag um, land with golf courses. Is that correct? Am I understanding that correctly? Okay. Golf so courses and golf ag ag remainders. Well, okay. Ag but like putt putt courses or anything like that. That. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none. Richard? I make a motion that we uh, 
send the staff recommendations to the commissioners. I hear a second. With a favorable approval. Right, with a favorable. Yeah, I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to move to um, send a favorable recommendation to the commissioners for the restaurants in the agricultural district. Um, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Send it up. All right. 17, substance abuse definitions and zoning code. Um, so just a little history on this one. On June 29th of this year, um, the board met to discuss uses in the agricultural and conservation zones. We had a work session in this room where we had the use table in front of them. We had some other information and they did go through it to discuss kind of what you've been talking about, the appropriateness of other uses in the agricultural district, um, just generally speaking. So um, one area of concern was the lack of clarity in the definitions pertaining to drug treatment facilities, which under federal law are included in the definitions of nursing home and assisted living facilities. And, and really this came up because there was a nursing home in front of the, a conversion of a nursing home, I believe, in front of the BZA that was going to be and is going to be a drug treatment facility. But under federal law, the distinction cannot be made between a nursing home as we would think of it for elderly people and the, um, the drug treatment facility. So in an effort to provide this clarity for citizens in the future, the Board of County Com Commissioners referred this issue to the Planning Commission pursuant to the zoning code, but the motion was limited to the revision of relevant definitions and did not include directions for a review of any other regulations because it is understood that under federal and I believe state law, we cannot we cannot change what's in the use table regar regarding drug treatment facilities without impacting all nursing homes and assisted livings. So um, I, it's noted there that this applies to all zoning districts because it's definitions, but really it's not a substantive change to the code, it's a clarification that we're proposing be made. So just, even though we're not changing this, by way of information, these are all the districts from the ag all the way to the employment campus where these uses are permitted by conditional use and permitted by right, which is the C and the P. Um, you can see that um, assisted living and nursing home are conditional uses in the ag conservation and all the residential and permitted by right in the um, commercial districts. And we'll get to those other uses a little bit later because we are gonna impact those in a different way. Um, so what we're proposing is this definition, a new definition, again, not a new use in the use table, just a new definition that says a drug treatment facility is a licensed facility that specializes in the evaluation and treatment of drug addiction, alcoholism, and associated disorders. This facility may provide residential treatment, partial hospital treatment, or outpatient treatment services. The facility may provide a treatment program for behavioral health services only if established and operated in accordance with applicable state laws for residential treatment programs. And we have had our county attorney look at this definition and he is happy with it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then we're taking that new definition and then applying it to these existing definitions. Again, just for clarity. So the first one is assisted living facility and it's all what we traditionally think of as assisted living facility. We are simply adding at the end of that that an assisted living facility, and this needs to be changed, may include a drug treatment facility. Not includes, I, I thought I'd change that. Well, they could be, could be may together. Be. Right, it, yes, and building. that's all it's pointing out so that citizens know when they see that there's a conditional use for an assisted living facility that it may be a drug treatment facility, because it may. And that's really just what's being. Um, so I'm, I'm still on. So it would be I have an assisted living. Um, I have five extra rooms that I could incorporate drug treatment 
in with that at the same time? I'm not sure separate? if the state licensing would allow that, but the whole building could be a drug treatment facility, right. which under that I federal get. law is, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't believe that. So under our uh, definition for drug treatment center, we uh, require it to be licensed by the state. And I don't believe that the state license would permit a sort of, I know, like mixed use um, of a assisted living facility and a drug treatment facility in the same structure. Yeah, I, I don't either, but I think I would like to see something about two separate so it's nobody is ever confused. I'd agree. Having okay. um, we can assisted living, so. Okay. And Mary, can I ask you to go back two slides to show us where that's permitted mm -hmm. there, this conditional use? So we've got assisted living facilities that now we're saying could, could include drug treatment centers, and we're going to allow those in R40, R20, and R10 with we're a conditional? We're not now saying it. We're now making it clear that they do. Okay. Because we're not changing that. They currently do. We just want everybody, the commissioners, want everybody to be aware that that's what that includes under federal law. Yeah. I get it. So we're not changing anything. Okay. Does a retreat yeah. facility follow federal guidelines also? I don't what, believe what would so, you but consider a retreat facility. Okay, let me go to um, definition. the definition is on this slide. Um, a site. I, I guess I won't read it all, but you see at the bottom of that slide. Um, and what we're saying about the retreat facility, to be clear, is that it does not include the drug treatment facility. I got ahead of myself. Okay. <laughs> so let me go back. Um, so the assisted living may include, and again, I'll have to change that language. That was original language that we were playing with. Um, but the day, a daycare center does not include a drug, drug treatment facility. Right. But a nursing home as assisted living may include it under federal law, so that's what we're pointing out. And then a retreat facility, lest there be any confusion, may not, is not a drug treatment facility. So we took those four definitions and just made it really clear what may include it and what may not include it. Um, and that's really all we have on that one. We consider this a clarification of the code, um, and I know the commissioners do too. There was a bit of a, a a lengthy discussion about this. So this is another one that, um, unless you wanted us to come back with further information on this, you, you could send this we, back. To we the can't officers. differ from federal law. Can federal I? law already says you can do it. Right. right. Now right. it just clarifies it so whenever anybody ever wants to put an assisted living in, everybody knows well, that it could right. be a drug treatment exactly. center. Exactly. And why not? And oppose it. Right. And why not separate the drug treatment facility language from nursing home? Or assisted living. Or assist, uh, it just seems. You mean to in me, the use to like separate it completely? Yeah, if you clump it together, it just. Uh, it, because by federal law, it is clumped together, and and we we did discuss that. But if you put it in the use table as a separate use, you might be creating some other problems. Like if someone has a conditional use for one, and then wants to convert it, they have the right to convert it. But under our zoning code, it would be a different use, and they might have to go through a different process. I, so, I, just, I mean, Jim, do you want to speak to why you probably wouldn't recommend that? I, I think um, my only heartburn with the way it's currently written is, so we all understand this. Um, right. We have people that are looking to place their parents in an assisted living. Right. If they happen to come across these kind of definitions mm -hmm. and they see talking also about yeah. Um, drug, drug treatment, treatment facility, treatment. Oh. they can be confused. So I just think language that clarifies not together in the same facility, but yeah. a separate um, time. Yeah. If we can work on that language to make it a, yeah. to make it clear that it's a one or the other. Correct. Right. And then it's yeah. governed by state licenses. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drug treatment facilities, you know, also treat mental health. There's exactly. so many other. Yes. Sure. Offshoots to that compared to what a nursing, you know, not mm -hmm. diminishing what nursing homes do, but it's different. It's way different. Mm -hmm. So, right. Well, and I, I have a son who was in social work for a number of years and he worked with a facility like this and there was serious blowback from neighborhoods right. where, it, you know, a facility may have been converted from an assisted living for 
primarily elderly care, dementia, those kinds of things, to um, kind of an outpatient care for people with um, drug dependencies. There was a big difference in, in terms of the neighborhood's perception of what should be allowed there or what they thought was approved. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, I, I'm not, a, I, we need these types of facilities. I just think being able to um, manage expectations is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I agree. Um, so I, I guess the question before us is, is there any public comment <laughs> about that? Okay, seeing none, um, what is our pleasure? Do we want to see any changes before we send it up or know that um, Mr. Altman will tweak it for us and send It'll be a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, way to right. go. <laughs> you got this. Thanks, Jim. Um, so what, what do you all wish? Wish? I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to, I, I, I think it needs to be separated. And I know the state says this and that, but I just, it's, it's so different from the nursing home and what Pete just said, absolutely. You know, folks I know saw this on our agenda and got a lot of feedback about this. It's, they're just completely different facilities, treatment processes, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of blowback if we just put this, lump this in with nursing homes. I, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I think the issue is so should it's we state federal they yeah. do that so we do have to follow those guidelines yeah i hear you yeah but we can add something um that so do I, should i can i make a motion that we add something <laughs> as big as that is i don't know i mean that's up to you it's this will be referred back to the uh, board of county commissioners with either favorable as is um you could do you know favorable with conditions, uh, which would be the new language or unfavorable, but it's ultimately up to the, the Board of County Commissioners to resolve the, the language issue. Yeah. So, maybe. so I don't know if you, you can take another bite at this apple where staff will go back, will rework the language, present it back to you uh, for your thoughts and comments, and so, then you can refer it back up yeah, to. I, I, so I, th I, th I think, I, I'm, I'm not ready to make a motion on no, this I'm because not. we would like to take another look at it sure. once it's revised. Right. And so can we table it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we can come back I think with that's more what we want to do. Yeah, information exactly. and new language. You understand, I agree. You understand the concerns? Yes, sir. And you can work on language given our concerns. Because I, yes. I would think the, the county commissioners would have similar and, and it, you know, let's push it back. Let, let's fi try to fix it here. Sure. And, and before it goes up the flagpole more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. All right. On to number 18. Commercial centers. Land commercial centers. Okay. Again. Following this template, we've been using the background of this is on November 3rd of last year, a concerned citizen in the Freedom Area requested that the Board of County Commissioners refer the issue of second story residential uses accessory to planned commercial centers to the Planning Commission for their review. You all discussed this on March 29th. It was an evening meeting um, as an introduction to it. And the discussion centered around the genesis and history of this use in the county code, which I'll go over again because I know we have a few new members and it's been a while. The appropriateness of it at all commercial locations and the deficiencies in the appeals process. Just as a reminder, this was a case you had before you that you denied went to the BZA who then approved it. Um, the possibilities of strengthening the authority of the Planning Commission to deny the use as well as the imposition of architectural design guidelines were discussed at that March 29th meeting. 
So again, the background is planned commercial centers are three or more retail stores, service establishments, medical facilities, or other commercial uses designed as a unit and primarily served by common accessories such as signs, parking lots, and walkways. This is essentially the definition of a shopping center, and it's been in the code for many, many years. Um, a planned commercial center is allowed by right in all three C1, C2, C3, all three commercial districts with that definition. And it, you see it to the far right, also a lot of additional regulations that are in the subdivision and development code 155. So what we're talking about here though, what was sent to the planning commission was very limited, not to look at the whole plan commercial center issue, but simply the second story accessory uses. So that's what's highlighted here. An accessory use on a planned commercial center on the second story, provided the structure is not more than a total of two stories, residential units may be provided on the second story of the structure. No residential use is permitted on the first structure. Again, as you can see under number two, they have to be between 600 and 1,000 square feet in size, go through concurrency management, um, be subject to impact fees if they're in place. And then that last number five is regarding redevelopment, which was really put in place to allow Princess Shopping Center to, to, um, to create the, their second story units. So that's the existing code right now, and that's what we're talking about, number one. So <coughs> after the last meeting, the staff got together and talked about uh, different options, given your discussion. So the first one is, no change to the existing code. A second story residential unit between 600 and 1,000 square feet in size may be approved by the Planning Commission, and then the approval process remains the same. The other side of that coin is to delete altogether the allowance of accessory dwellings in planned commercial centers. This wouldn't have a significant impact on the ground because there's only been two site plans with this accessory use that have been approved. Um, but you might want to grandfather these so they would not become non-conforming if that's what you wanted to do. From, um, from planning's perspective, this is not consistent with the housing goals in the 2018 Freedom Plan, which called for more diverse housing opportunities. And it, I'm not sure what that third bullet is <laughs> indicating. I believe that it's contrary to the Freedom Plan. Um, Number three, add specific site requirements where this may be appropriate. And this was something you talked a little bit about. When we talked about that as staff, we came up with things like, well, it should be in a designated growth area or on a major, major arterial road near other supporting commercial uses. The problem with adding that to the code would be that would have allowed the planned commercial center that started this um, whole process that everybody was objected to. So that wouldn't really solve the problem at hand. Then we talked about design guidelines, um, possibly including um, orientation of the building to the front, parking to the back, sidewalks, reduced parking requirements, roofs, wall sections, varied setbacks, building materials. Um, and I'm gonna just read this and then let Laura Matthias expand on it from their perspective as the agency that would have to be implementing this. Design guidelines, and we did look into other jurisdictions that have them, they are very difficult to interpret and enforce as they're very subjective usually. And if they're more specific, such as specific building materials, then they're not gonna be appropriate in all cases. Um, staff and DARC currently have the ability to recommend these changes and the Planning Commission already has the ability to impose them at site plan approval. So we also believe that development of site of design guidelines would require a great deal of staff and planning commission effort to develop and um, implement. So I'm gonna turn this over to Laura as the Bureau Chief of Development Review. Thanks, Mary. You're welcome. Um, yes, so just to, uh, the, the key there is with design guidelines, it's subjective, right? I may love Frank Gehry's architecture and Janice may not want to ever step foot anywhere near one of his buildings, right? So we, we're looking at an entire county here and it's very difficult to establish guidelines that would be applicable throughout the county. So um, besides the, the fact that the time and effort put in there, but I don't think that we could ever arrive at a distinct conclusion, but more importantly, when we come before you with these site plans, you, our design and architectural review committee has looked at it, they provide suggestions to you, and you have a lot of authorities granted to you by the code. 
in what direction you offer, particularly we've had these conversations lately. When we come before you with a concept plan, that's when we're looking for your distinct direction per that plan, which direction you want it to head. And you do. You can look at the um, layout of the site. Right? You can look at the lighting. You can look at the design. You can give feedback and direction on any of those things. So we really felt that you already had the authority to make uh, decisions, suggestions, recommendations that would cover these type of things that you, you had discussed. All right, since I was the one that was vocal on this, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to you know, the only one. Yeah. <laughs> and I take off on this a little bit. Um, in that the two examples that we have of this, um, the, the first one really wasn't ex executed very well. Um, and that is the perception of the community, of the Freedom District. Um, we sought to improve that and we actually made suggestions during the concept plan design to the developer and he did nothing he didn't make a single change and I mean to I mean we made recommendations concerning landscaping lighting sidewalking sidewalks and um, storm control and he came back and no changes were made at all not a single revision. He yeah, didn't take. They, they they added the sidewalk in front of the building. That was it. That yeah. didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. The sidewalk to nowhere. All right. So, you know, the 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 notion I have in my head, and I don't disagree with it. Every everything you say makes total sense to me. I mean, it is subjective. And, but but if we're going to add a residential component, it shouldn't simply look like a Safeway. It should look a little more residential. Now, how do we do that? And, you know, I think we do that three or four different ways. I think you do it architecturally. I think we do it, I'm sorry, I think we do it architecturally. I think we do it with landscaping. I think we do it with lighting. Um, but there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement that there are going to be people here 24-7. And, and it needs to be softer. The other thing that we need to do is, is there needs to be an accommodation of the fact that it is residential. The, the facility that the gentleman built there are no laundry facilities on the premises, and as a consequence, people hang their laundry out on the balconies. Now, you know, and again, that's not the end of the world. But that's not, we, the Freedom District doesn't want to look like something that um, has rooms no rented district. by the hour. No you know, we don't want to look like that. We, do, we don't want this to be um, a slum. We, 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 we basically have permitted a slum. Now, I'm being, I am being dramatic for impact. It's not as bad as I've made it sound, but it's not good, Laura, and we can do better. And again, that's, I think, what, the, what we're asking for as citizens is if we're going to allow this in the code, let's make sure that when it's executed, it's executed correctly. And if the BZA is not going to back us up on this, and it's a de novo hearing, and it is, and it should be because the developer has rights, let's tighten up the code so that the BZA has to back us up. That's what we're asking for as citizens. And so um, I actually turned into a pumpkin five minutes ago. I'm supposed to be in my car. Um, I, 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 am I the only one who thinks this? Am I? Am I well, if I am, I'm, I'll, I'll be quiet. Not at all. You know, my, my comments were at our last meeting was is the biggest problem was is it is an industrial area. There is assisted living across the road, but it, the residential part doesn't really fit. It really needs to fit into something. I don't think there's anything wrong with them, but, it, you know, the residents need to be able to go somewhere. You know, there's residents down behind them, but there's no connection with them. And, and frankly, they don't want to be connected. Those are single-family homes. It's not like it's a part and apartment complex back there. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, somehow we need to tighten it up where it needs to be built into a com more of a community-type thing and not be separated by a state highway with no crosswalks, no hmm. nothing. That kids that are going to be living in that, those apartments, are going to have to go to school across the road, and the school bus isn't going to come pick them up. They're going to have to walk across that road, or their parents are going to have to drive them. So, 
Um, anyway, that's my soap box. I, I think what I'm hearing is that we possibly aren't ready to send it up and want to see some more tightening. I'm not sure what that would look like. Um, the design guidelines, I totally agree. They're extremely hard to say. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> you can do this or, or that. Um, and you also have, um, you know, the developer's rights that mm -hmm. he has as far as laundry on your um, porch that would honestly fall under the developer and any restrictions he would place in his um, building. So uh, we are limited to a degree. Uh, but I see you well, have some We had some a fifth options. option that we're not necessarily recommending as staff. This would be to change it from accessory to a conditional use, similar to what we talked about, you know, co-locating um, restaurants with golf courses. This is sort of a co-location of the second story with the Plant Commercial Center. Um, and again, this additional step would allow for more citizen input, but we wanted to be realistic in pointing out, out that it is unlikely to result in a denial. Exactly. Uh, because the, you know, they're constrained by the Schultz v. Pritz yep. parameters. I, again, I think what we want is, is to tighten up so that if it goes to BZA, they at least have some indication as to what it should look, feel like, and where it should be. And because, I mean, put, putting this out 26, you know, where there's, there's not a McDonald's within walking distance that you can safely get to. I mean, there's not a fast food, the, the, the. But this isn't only for no. that particular parcel. It's anywhere. This is for anywhere. other parcels yeah. that may have more access to um, other facilities. So I think um, I, am I right in the only way it would go to BZA currently now is for it to go there as we did on this on property. Appeal. Correct. Um, so the only way to do to BZA would be to change it, which is questionable mm -hmm. as to how that would end up. So maybe um, developing some type of guidelines that we as a commission can put forth on, um, I guess the architectural part may help some. I don't know. So the design um, guidelines that we were just discussing? Yeah, I would think. Um, I am open. And Pete has to go. I do. But um, I think we have uh, comments from the, the gallery. I'd like to hear what they have to say. Okay. And, I'm, and I'll be out. Thank okay. you. Hi, uh, my name is Bill McCormick. I live in Eldersburg, um, actually directly behind the property. Um, I'm, I'm having all... trouble hearing you. Can you speak a little? Sorry, uh, is this better? Yes. Uh, my name is Bill McCormick. I live directly behind the, the property that you all have been talking about that's currently being developed. Um, so there has been a large community response against past and current projects. Um, I actually had folks come out and sign a petition, physically sign, a petition. I got about 150 signatures. Um, so that means they got in their car on a cold and windy March day on a Sunday and came out and signed that petition for me. Uh, all of those signatures were against second story apartments um, for planned commercial centers. The community just does not want this type of project here. Um, so the argument against design guidelines is that they're subjective, but so is the current code. Uh, and we've seen how far that gets us. You know, you all make a decision, it gets appealed, the BZA rubber stamps it, and it goes forth. Uh, and uh, Mr. Lester, I would like to correct you. Uh, the developer did make a change to the concept plan. He actually removed landscaping from the plan. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm all well and good with folks wanting to come in and develop 
develop property. Um, I, I, I believe one of you said that you want folks to come in and invest in our community, and I'm for that. But if you want them to invest in our community, make them invest in our community. Make them spend the money to make something that people can be proud of. That's all I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public? Good afternoon. Kelly Schaefer Miller, 73 East Main Street, Westminster, Maryland, 21157. As many of you are aware, I represent Mike Stavlas, who is the developer that everyone's been speaking about. He uh, has the approval at the site that Mr. McCormick just spoke about and the existing Princess Shopping Center. I just want to reflect briefly on what Mary said at the introduction, which is nobody dislikes transparency. So having some kind of specific set of requirements, nobody is opposed to that and nobody is asking for anything different than that. What I would request is that anything that has been approved be protected and be grandfathered in recognizing that a, sh a drastic shift, and I, you have not made any decision on what you're recommending here today, and so we're not sure what direction this is gonna take. But it's worth noting that a drastic shift to this code could result in a developer having invested millions of dollars in a community and now having a development that's non-conforming. Uh, that's a significant impact to a developer. It's also a significant deterrent to future developments. And I think that the, the impetus for the Planned Commercial Center was to have some kind of mixed development allowance in our county. If you look at our code, there's very few areas where you can have a sort of mixed development with this commercial and residential. So I, I would ask that as this progresses through the process that you keep that in mind. Um, and, and again, I don't, I don't think any side has an objection to additional transparency in the code. I know my client certainly doesn't. It's just a protection of the, that investment that has been made in this county already. Um, and that's all I'll say for today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Um, all right. So in terms of where we're headed here, um, again, I, I would like to see, you know, that if we allow for residential I figured as much. and commercial, <laughs> uh, um, she, she figured as much, if we allow for it, um, that there be some additional accommodations in terms of of landscaping so, so that so that it looks residential and and um, uh, f you know traffic circulation uh, security um, laundry facilities all of those things need to be considered and it's not just um, a, a 600 fair square foot studio I, I'm not I'm not so sure so sure that, that is a sufficient size to do what so that people can live in the manner in which they've again I, I, well, my aspirations are and what others are I can't I can't correct, yeah, yeah so I got to leave that alone yeah. so and if we what we want is diverse housing that's fine but it again it needs to be compatible with the the what, what freedom aspires to be, because this is primarily going to happen in freedom. We can talk about the county, and it has to apply to the county, and I get it. The two facilities that have been developed so far are in the Freedom District, and that's where I think we'll see more of it be developed. I well, mean, I think we could yeah. see more throughout the county, yeah. keeping in mind our county planning commission. Right. So yeah. we're speaking on behalf of I get it. Uh, the I county. Get it. Um, I... I hear what you're saying and don't disagree, but I'm not sure that some of that is in our purview to say that they have to have laundry or other things in a unit um, is, I mean, there are probably houses that are built people don't have laundry in. So uh, may seem far-fetched, but I've seen plenty. Um, <coughs> I would like to see him maybe throw out some other guideline changes because, like I said, I, I had the problem with the interconnectability of the residential part of it to where they, those people would be going. I mean, yeah, they put a sidewalk in front of it, but the sidewalk doesn't go up to the corner. There's no no access to go anywhere else. 
I just think I've seen these projects be really nice. Go to Frederick, they're all over the place. That's right. In the yeah. front of big residential places, right. but I just I didn't like where it was placed. I you know, didn't it didn't fit the box very well because True. the people that are there are kind of boxed in. They're they're gonna have yeah. a commercial center, they're gonna have restaurants there, but just what's right there and that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Maybe we need to review what some of our surrounding counties do That's a great idea. with their. Well, we we have done that. I think part of the problem, and we certainly can come back to you with maybe not architectural guidelines as much as site um, mm -hmm. design guidelines, because that's where I hear you're going. Okay. The difference between us and some of what you're talking about in Frederick is we don't have large mixed juice zones the way we do. If you're talking about the villages of Urbana right. and some of those, we don't. Yeah. We just don't have that. So, I mean, it, we would be different. Um, but we can we can come back to you. We can work some more on this. Okay. And, and you know, Mary, that may be the direction to go because we've talked off and on about mixed-use developments mm -hmm. and whether or not we could I – mean, the Beattie property is a prime example where mixed-use development would be uh, – we were basically getting a mixed-use development without – we were having to piecemeal it. Mm -hmm. But th that's a great opportunity for us to to implement something if we can implement it well. I mean, do, if we put it in the code and we do it poorly, no one's going to be happy. Um, right. I'm sorry. I have to leave. And but thank you all. I, I know I've taken up more than my share of bandwidth. Thank you. Okay. All right. So you're going to review, bring it, back. bring it back to us. Perfect. Here's a threat. <laughs> Nineteen. Because they're dropping like flies here. <laughs> <laughs> the book requirements. The strong remain, I guess. <laughs> the last text amendment is bulk requirements in the commercial zones. Um, this was referred by the Board of County Commissioners on May 4th, and their direction was to examine bulk requirements of commercial districts when abutting residential districts. So not a residential use, but strictly residential districts. So the summary of the text amendment will be to examine whether the bulk requirements for commercial districts should be increased or decreased when abutting the residential districts. Currently in the commercial districts, the following requirements will be observed for non-residential and group living uses in the commercial districts. So the front yard has a minimum of 10 feet, side yard has a minimum of 10 feet, rear yard has a minimum of 15 feet, and then the height is a maximum of 50 feet. So here's just an illustration of what those may look like. Um, we have a note here saying building footprints will not extend to the setback lines due to other site requirements such as landscaping, stormwater management, and parking. So you wouldn't have the building going all the way to the um, setback requirement lines. <clears throat> so we made a map of where this um, text am amendment uh, would affect. So these areas circled are areas where a commercial district directly abuts a residential district. So obviously a lot in the Freedom area on 140 between Westminster and Finksburg, um, a little piecemeal in Manchester and Hampstead, Tawnytown, Taylorsville, and then one right off 97. So that, those are areas where this text amendment would be affecting. So some options for you to discuss, um, this will be really on what you guys would like to see moving forward. Um, we can have no changes to the current bulk requirements, increase or decrease the current bulk requirements, and then we can also bring back some additional information. Just tell us what you may need um, to aid in those discussions, whether it's mapping, surrounding jurisdictions, or current heights from around the county. And we are currently working on some of this information for your discussions. So I guess if it's just anything else that may be helpful for you guys to make a decision. And that's all I have. Is it possible to put this back on our next meeting mm -hmm. because we've lost at least two of our more vocal <laughs> numbers right. about this. So 
I'm sure they would have some input along with her other gentlemen. Um, we would also like to bring, we're doing some research on the heights around the county. Mm -hmm. um, it's taking a little bit of time, but to find out how many 40 foot buildings we even have that are abutting residential. So you'd know what you were really working with, what right. the magnitude of the problem is to, to be fixed. We've also looked at some options in other jurisdictions about well, sort of a sliding scale height to what's next to it. So we, we've got some options to bring back. We're really not as proposing one or two at this point. We would like to bring you back more information. Okay, yes. perfect. Great. Okay. Um, any comment from public on this? Shoot. Come on up. Hi, I'm Nancy Lynch, 6503 Carroll Highlands Road. And I think this agenda item was uh, precipitated by the pushback that our uh, neighborhood has been pushing back against the Carroll Highland storage facility that was going to be uh, 50 feet tall, 100, over 100,000 square feet. And if I could just show on this map, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is from the county website, and we can bring it closer, but I'll just point out. This is the site. This is Liberty Road. This is Carroll Highlands Road. And this is our house. And we were going to be um, about 25 feet from the entrance because SHA has denied access off Liberty Road since 2018. So the only way all this construction would be able to get in would be right next to our house. And the developer we asked and he told us it would take about a year and a half, two years of construction. Um, we were not happy about it being there, but we were really upset about the two years of construction. Um, we also um, believe that uh, possibly this um, site was incorrectly zoned when it was part of the commercial, uh, re the comprehensive rezoning that was done in 2019. Uh, we had a town hall just on this subject where 250 people came just to oppose this project. And many people brought up the fact that possibly it was not zoned correctly. When they changed it from BNR, Business Neighborhood Retail, to C2, um, I, I researched it and I have an analysis and some reasons why we think that it possibly was not zoned correctly. So I'd like to present that to you. Maybe I could give it to Laura to, to give out to you. Um, we also had a petition. Uh, we had over 2,000 people sign it uh, online, and over 500 people came, just like Bill said, for his project that are opposed to this, because it's totally surrounded by homes. So if you're looking at a number of feet, we believe that something so close to so many homes shouldn't be any closer than 200 feet. Uh, it should have a height requirement, max two stories, not five stories. Uh, we heard this was originally going to be 59 feet tall, so he lowered it to 50, and he's calling it four stories. It was going to have 752 units. <coughs> it never did a traffic study to know how, much, how many cars would come and trucks, what kind of vehicles. Um, during the technical review, many of those agencies denied it. There's not enough sight distance. So there are many reasons that we're really glad that you are looking at the bulk requirements for this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Sure. You want to come up to the microphone? challenged 
My name is Audrey Novak. I live at 6505 Carroll Highlands Road. I'm the second house away from the proposed project in um, the Freedom District. I'm going to just kind of dovetail a lot of what Nancy said, but um, for the past 16 months, the residents of Carroll Highlands and the surrounding communities of the Freedom District have worked hard to protect and maintain the quality of our residential neighborhood. I have been a resident there for 33 years. I raised three children in that neighborhood, and the neighborhood has maintained the quality that it was when, when I moved there in 1990, and I, and I would love to see it continue that way. Um, <coughs> at, at the open meeting um, in March, Commissioner Rothstein acknowledged that the magnitude of the community interest in the surrounding proposed storage facility project, um, he said that the number of people who were in attendance, you know, um, spoke, to, uh, spoke to that. At that open session, Commissioner Rothstein mentioned that the, and this is a quote, clear facts are that the property is zoned commercial. Um, there's never been a question that that is the zoning, other than um, what Nancy brought up, that it was changed from BNR. Um, but the fact is that it, currently it is C2, which limits commercial product, projects that are permitted. In examining zoning regulation 158.158, self-service self storage facility, it seems that the regulations pertain to individual units, not a multi-unit building that was proposed. Our commissioner spoke to the project being within the parameters of the zoning regulations and that the commissioners had the power to adjust the law. He said that the zoning definitions were deliberate, but I feel that they are vague and need to incorporate the difference between a one-story self-service storage facility and a massive five-story 700-plus um, unit building that borders a quiet residential neighborhood. Um, that disparity is what Prince George's County has defined in newly adopting their regulation that these types of storage facilities be placed in industrial zoned areas. Uh, I'm grateful that in May the commissioners voted, and that's why we're here today, because they voted to send this back to you to have the Planning and Zoning Commission clarify what constitutes a self-service storage facility in the business climate of 2023, um, not 1965 when the property was uh, uh, initially zoned. Um, in that process, we ask that you limit the height the distance from residential properties and adequate road access, as Nancy um, mentioned. Our commissioner mentioned that the zoning needs to be adjusted for all of the county. Indeed, what happens in South Carroll, as we have mentioned, um, impacts the entire county. The parameters need to be so tight that there's no um, need for interpretation. And once a project goes forward, there's no turning back. Um, and if I can go back to some of the um, parameters for the uh, cannabis facilities, talking about 400 feet from a residential property and no variance. And that's what we want because it seems like the parking variance is what started all this in March of 22. Um, the change, and we weren't allowed to express any other concerns other than the parking because we were told this was just to talk about parking. But from there, this has grown and um, we, want, we want you to make the changes before the shovels are in the ground. Thank you for your time and energy. Thank you. Um, and I think what we're asking is that staff is going to bring it back and we'll probably look at it more in depth next time. Um, not sure if it'll be the next meeting or the one after, but um, whatever works into that. And I will say, since this all has come up, I've been astutely aware of the storage facilities. So wherever I go, mm. I'm like, how high is that one? Mm. That, that one. Um, but I have seen that even ones that are four and five story, which I just saw on the way back from the ocean the other day, um, they have very limited parking lots because the 
I guess the the people that use them, not everybody jumps there. Sometimes they're there in the middle of the night, early in the morning. Um, so it's not like it's an influx of people that do come in. So I don't think the parking lot would be as much of a concern um, if some of the other items were changed. So um, moving on. Is there any additional general public comment? Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So move. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, all right, <laughs> we will see you all next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know. On Barbieheimer week? Oh. <laughs>